окупанти до нас в Україну Форма новенька воєнні машини Та трохи поплавився їх інвентар Байрактар Байрактар Російські танкісти сховали скучі Щоб лавтим посьорбати довбані щі Та трохи у чах перегрівся на бар Байрактар Великой страны. Всяке озброєння, різне потужні ракети, машини залізні у нас на всі доводи є коментар. Байрактар. Байрактар. Вони захопити хотіли на зразу, а ми зачаїли на орків образу з російських бандитів. Робить примар. Байрактар. Російська поліція справи заводить, там пивцю рашистів ніяк не знаходить, хто винен, що в нашому полі глухар. Байрактар. Байрактар. Веде пропаганду кремлівський урод, слова пропаганди ковтає народ, тепер нове слово знає цар. Байрактар. 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 Oh. 
Hello, everyone. I'm the Enforcer, and I'm accompanied by Enforcer Matt. And good evening, folks. It's Enforcer Matt, and welcome back to Day 783 of the News. And it's good to see you all once again. And Russia is looking for even more trouble than they're already in. And it's good to see you all once again. And, of course, we're going to be covering the yeah. past... Oh, there we go. Uh, apparently bad lag right there. But, and of course, we're going to be covering the past 24 hours of the news of the war in the Middle East. And we're also going to be covering the past 48 hours of the news of the ongoing war inside of Ukraine. There is a large amount of news that we have to cover in both categories. But I do want to take a special moment to point out something that I thought was incredibly hilarious and something that we've seen, many of y'all have seen, at the beginning of the stream. Uh, for the entire first nine minutes of the stream, it was only showing that 150 people were here live on this live stream and was not showing that we have received any likes at all. That is because YouTube is having a massive glitch, apparently, some kind of a massive cyber attack or some kind of a glitch, which pretty much shut down YouTube's abilities for live streams to even really exist rather than being on air uh, for about those eight to nine minutes. It looks like the problem may have been fixed right now, but that means, technically, YouTube broke before the Lee Spring Army broke. And that is something that I gotta say is unbelievable to see. And I've been, in, I, I was incredibly proud to see so many people in the live chat, so many people here. But at the same time, we were not being, uh, we weren't able to even see any of y'all represented in the control room for the amount of viewers we had. I gotta thank the Lee Spring Army for always being a dedicated and never ending cause of people who are always here, always watching the streams, and always supporting the right cause around the world. Especially considering that we now hear that the Russians are extending their their arm into the Middle East against the Israelis and creating an anti-Western front, things have been incredibly severe and incredibly serious. I also like to uh, say this as well. I have heard that many people are uh, are currently dealing with a lot of issues uh, with them being unsubscribed. I've heard that a lot of viewers have been unsubscribed today, so I just want to make sure that we give a PSA to all of y'all that you go back and check uh, the Enforcer channel and make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, and if you're not, resubscribe, because I, we've heard a lot of people saying that they have been unsubscribed from the channel. We still have around 192,000 subscribers on the channel, uh, so make sure to just keep up to date on if you're subscribed or not, because you might not be. But... With that. And also, oh, go ahead. also, just so everybody knows as well, YouTube is having a major outage right now. If you go check uh, downdetector.com, they are having reports through the roof uh, that YouTube is having a major issue. So it's over uh, 14,000 reports, which is the most I've ever seen. Uh, so it looks like YouTube's having a pretty serious uh, server issue uh, as we speak. But of course, one thing's for certain, while YouTube may be going through the tumults of war and the torrents of uh, having their servers go down, one thing is for certain. The Lee Spring Army will never die. The Lee Spring Army will be here until the final server at YouTube's headquarters putters out for good. We will continue to be on air as Enforcer Matt and me continuing to cover this news and continuing to make sure that y'all get the updates of what's going on around the world. Put the Lee Spring Army in the chat. Put Nalise in the chat because tonight is the night of nights. The Lee Spring Army will last longer than YouTube can. But with that, it is time for us to move on into the major news inside the Middle East as we got breaking news today from a statement from the Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation, Sergei Shoigu, that apparently the Russians have joined the side of Iran and if Israel attacks the Iranians in any way, Russia will respond in the, uh, in the retaliatory strike by the Iranians in response to the upcoming Israeli uh, retaliatory strike that is on the way. We have heard that apparently, according to uh, Russian uh, and Iranian regime affiliated media, Russian Defense Minister Sh uh, Sergei Shoigu announced in a letter to the U.S. Department of Defense that if Israel launches a possible retaliatory strike against Iran, Russia will also participate in the Iranian counterattack. This is incredibly large news and is showing that the Iranians are getting backing from the Russians at this point and that the Russians are now involved in the Middle East as well. This is something that is incredibly concerning and it is showing that there is largely a united anti-Western front being created by the Russian Federation. I'm fairly certain that some people's heads are exploding because some people act like the Russians are the bad guys uh, in Ukraine, which they are, that's a rightful statement, but at the same time, the, uh, the Iranians are the good guys in the Middle East. Now, for some people, the good guys and the bad guys are teaming up together to fight against the collective West, 
Which I'd have to say must be making some people's head ex heads explode because I don't think they really know how to even make sense of this and how to explain why the good guys are teaming up with the bad guys. I, I wouldn't know. I have no idea. But one thing I will say is that the reason why the good guys are teaming up with the bad guys, at least with how some people would say it, is because they're both bad guys. The Islamic Republic of Iran is an evil dictatorial regime along with the Russian Federation, and they are both united together, even in separate conflicts, to support each other in the destruction of the West's and the Western interests as a whole. That's why we did not side with Iran uh, at the beginning of this of this coverage of the news way back a few days ago, on, you know, four days ago. Because the thing is, is that this channel, while trying to be as unbiased as possible with our news coverage, is a pro-Western channel. Regardless of where these conflicts are around the world or whatever news is going on around the world, we always support countries that are Western aligned or have Western interests involved, at least in their existence. And that's why we never said that the Iranians or any of the Iranian-backed groups are on the right side of history. History, because now we can see that they're certainly not, because the Russians are more than fans to try and protect them and help them out, although they're conducting a genocidal war inside of Ukraine. So, with that in mind, I'd have to say, it looks like things have sorted itself out, and it looks like we called it ahead of time. The Iranians are bad guys, period. Part of the axis of evil. Not that hard to not that hard to see once you actually see them start banding together. But moving on from that, we were also able to hear some fairly large news that apparently Iranian nuclear facilities are now operating like normal again. This was some uh, fairly large news because we did hear that on Sunday the Iranian nuclear research reactors had been shut down according to Rafael Grassi and then once again they have now been reopened as of today and are now in normal operations. This appears to be showing that the Iranians are probably trying to keep these nuclear research facilities up and running so that way they can try and get a operational or working nuclear weapon out of them uh, at some point here in the next few days or weeks as we now have very clear information that the Iranians will most likely have a testable nuclear weapon within that time frame this is all coming together to show that i believe and I'm, I'm going to try and put out a little bit of a theory here i believe that the russians are wanting the iranians to get a nuclear weapon because here's why the the time frame in this attack against israel and the escalations that are happening is something that normally the russians would not get involved in ever historically because it just wasn't really their problem but now that they know, and everyone largely knows around the world, that a nuclear weapon will be developed inside of Iran that's testable probably within the next few days or weeks, it becomes pertinent for the Russians to try and defend Iran and make sure that they are able to have an operational nuclear weapon. So that way, the Iranians are such a destabilizing and such a dangerous power in the Middle East, it will tie up a lot more U.S. resources and efforts in the region as compared to Eastern Europe, where the Russians really focus a lot of their time and effort on. For that reason, I think that's why the Russians have made a, such a quick and bold move to support Iran during the middle of this conflict, because, of course, it's in their interest to try and make sure that the West is as confused, as discombobulated as possible, and not only that, to put Western interests at a severe disadvantage, even if it means giving a very unstable country like Iran a nuclear weapon, or letting them produce their own nuclear weapon. This is something that I have to say is pretty insane to see, a, a straight-up Russian involvement. Um, but nevertheless, moving on from that and into our next bit of news, we also heard that you, the United States is announcing a new wave of sanctions uh, to impose on Iran, particularly on its missile and drone programs. Uh, this appears... Oh, no! It's like, why haven't we had those sanctions on them before now, though? It's like, you know, Iran hasn't been friendly to us for a long time. It's like, why do we wait to put them on them just now, since they've been trying to create nuclear uh, missiles and things like that? <laughs> now we're just going to decide to put the hammer down on them. Yeah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Not, no sense at all um, does it make to sound like Yoda for a bit. Uh, you would think that we would have put sanctions on this before, but apparently they're new sanctions, uh, brand new sanctions. I don't know if this means that they're being tacked on to older sanctions that have already existed in these categories, just becoming more strict or what. But nevertheless, I would have to say that this is a fairly demure response compared to uh, what we thought the U.S. response might possibly be, which would have been uh, airstrikes conducted against Iran in support of Israel. Moving on from that and into one of our last uh, bits of news that we got out of Iran, we heard that U.S., uh, uh, I guess you could say defense experts, if you want to, want to call them that, uh, said that it's certain that Iran will respond to an Israeli retaliatory strike. Uh, the U.S. assessment is that Iran would respond to any significant overt Israeli strikes on Iranian soil with a new round of missile and drone attacks, a senior U.S. official says. Uh, this was reported by Axios Today. 
I would have to say, if the Israelis are uh, have to be certain, according to these U.S. analysts, that the Iranians would launch a second strike on Israel uh, if they were to conduct an attack on Iran, I would largely have to say that doesn't mean uh, that means that the Israelis have absolutely nothing to worry about. They ended up shooting down the first attack, and only a few missiles made it through. So if they were able to do that the first time, I have a feeling that them doing that a second time probably wouldn't be that far of a stretch. However, the situation is much, uh, much more complicated now that the Russians seem to be uh, apt to be readily involved in the region if anything was to kick off again. And I'll be explaining what will happen considering that the Russians are now possibly involved in this whole fiasco, this whole debacle. Okay, so really quickly to go through a little bit of explanation, the Russians are in the Middle East. They're actually inside of the Assad regime controlled region of Syria, which requires me to go into the Syrian civil war and show you all the current front lines and where Russian forces would be. So really quickly, let me get here and let me show this map to all of y'all. This civil war has been going on for, I believe, 12 years. Uh, and actually 13. Round that up one more year. But this war has been going on a whopping 13 years. Up here in the north, in the yellow, are the U.S.-supported Syrian Democratic Forces. These are the forces that we hope would eventually take over Syria and begin to control most of it, or all of it, after the civil war was over. That's never really materialized, but nowadays they control the northern area of Syria, and they have a defensive line, I believe, across the Euphrates River, which you can see right here on the map. It's either the Tigris or the Euphrates. I'm not particularly sure which one, but it's one of the major rivers within the Middle East. Meanwhile... You have the forces in green up here. That's actually Turkey. Turkey invaded Syria back in 2019 and created a, a quote-unquote safe zone or a territorial exclusion zone so that way they could try and make sure that the war wasn't directly along their borders. This is a little bit weird because Turkey didn't really join in either on the side of the Russians who support the Assad regime in red or on the side of the Americans who uh, support the guys in yellow on this map. Turkey actually ended up invading both of them at the same time, which makes it a very complicated scenario because it's pretty much NATO on NATO and then NATO on the Russians as well at the same time and the actual Assad regime simultaneously. So this was a very complicated matter when it happened, but luckily everyone just ignored it and it went away. And the Turks control this territory up in the, uh, up in the northern areas in green up till this day. Then the large area that's in red, from Aleppo, which is a very famous city, everyone knows Aleppo because of the Battle of Aleppo, and all the way down to the city of Damascus, and all the way over to Deir Ezzor over here, this entire area in red is, con is controlled by the Bashar al-Assad regime. This is something that is a little interesting because they actually didn't control a lot of territory. They've actually been regaining a good amount of territory over the years. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the group that the Russians support, and this is where Russian forces are inside the Middle East, are within this area that's in red, usually around the major population areas near to the west coast of Syria. Then down here in this little green area right here that you see that's almost like a semicircle, that's actually the United States of America directly inside of, the, of Syria. Uh, U.S. forces occupy this area, which is, uh, I believe... Uh, the Atom uh, Exclusionary Zone, if that's the best name I could give for it. Tower 52 is actually on the very edge of this exclusionary zone, right across the Syrian border in Jordan. But Atom Camp is what makes up the very middle part of that. And those are the U.S. forces that are currently still inside of Syria at the moment. But beyond that, Russian forces are directly along, or hypothetically could be directly along the Israeli border. The issue is, is that the amount of Russian forces inside of Syria are incredibly limited and are also very niche in the kind of uh, in the kind of war that they're supposed to fight. Russian forces inside the Middle East are largely composed of nothing but air units, helicopters and aircraft that the Russian Air Force uses to try and conduct attacks on Syrian democratic forces as well as other forces within the region. They don't really have a lot of ground forces inside of Syria, and that's really the large divider in between their ability to really do anything to Israel or not, is that they don't have a lot of ground forces that are just actively inside of Syria. The number is quite low. Uh, but beyond that, another thing that is interesting is that because there is a very little amount of ground forces that the Russians have inside of Syria, if the Russians wanted to join in with the Iranians on conducting an attack on the Israelis, that means that they would have to uh, scramble their aircraft either from southern Russia and fly them over Syria and then launch missiles at Israel from there or try and launch missile attacks from aircraft that would take off from inside of Syria. Largely, Russian aircraft taking off from inside of Syria would probably be a pretty poor idea. I will show you all why. Allow me to demonstrate. 
Let's say a Patriot battery is right there on the map. Now, let's put out this marker right here. That is 56 miles. Now let's put it all the way out to here. Wow, that is a whopping 110 miles. That means that any Russian aircraft that took off from the area of Damascus and the Israelis had enough information to know that those aircraft were in fact carrying weapons that would be fired at Israel, and that means that they would be halfway inside of Patriot battery range, meaning that those aircraft would most likely be destroyed while they're even trying to gain altitude to be able to fire off the weapons. Any other Russian aircraft in the area could pro possibly fire their weapons from inside of Aleppo or Oms, or the general area in between the two, or even over towards Deir ez Zer, or even over Syrian Democratic Forces land. This is, once again, largely doesn't have a lot of air defense in it because it's a civil war faction in Syria, and all of them have pretty much been bled dry at this point. That's why it's mostly a stalemate. But if they were to fire off those missiles, even from relative safety, where the aircraft could not be shot down, we once again have to remember that the Israelis shot down something around 300 or so drones and 100 or so ballistic and cruise missiles combined in a single night. Going off of that, we have a very good understanding, a very good perception as a matter of fact, that a Russian attack on Israel, considering that the largest ones we've seen in Ukraine, have only gotten up to about 100 air targets in size, most of those being drones and about 20 to 30 of them being actual cruise missiles, we would have a really good understanding that the Russian attack would actually be far smaller than the Iranian attack and would be doing nothing more than helping to fluff up the numbers of air targets that are flying into Israel. Of course, inevitably, most if not all of them would still be shot down by Israeli air defense and would have practically no impact or effect on the state of Israel. This means that Russian involvement within conventional means in the region is highly... Uh, highly overplayed for the most part. It's it's concerning considering that it's a nuclear power threatening another nuclear power within the Middle East with uh, conventional warfare for the most part. But in the largest sense, this does not mean that the Israelis are now on the short end of the stick or they're about to get overplayed by the Iranians and the Russians. In reality, the Israelis could hold their own still as long as it's an air defense battle against the Russians and Iranians combined as we saw just a few days ago when the major missile attack from Iran was conducted. This leaves me, you know, to you know, to, to, to me, it's not really the dangerous part isn't really Russia attacking Israel or sending in planes to, you know, put missiles on target inside of Israel itself. To me, the most dangerous part is how is the West going to respond to that if that happens? Because that's going to basically mandate a Western response because they're attacking one of our allies. Um, because, like, obviously, like you said, Russia doesn't really have a lot of means to really attack Israel and really harm it. Kind of like Iran really doesn't either. But it's more about the diplomatic uh, consequences of their actions uh, that are going to lead to a really bad situation. And that's a great point, actually. That's that's what actually creates such a huge tensions about this. And not only that, Russia would be attacking with conventional means another nuclear power. And that rarely ever happens in world history. The only time that that actually happens, uh, at least from what I'm able to find historically, is in between India and Pakistan. Throughout uh, some of their more modern conflicts with each other, both sides actually did possess nuclear weapons. It's just that they never used them. So that's really the only two countries I've found precedent-wise in the world that have ended up going to war while both of them have nuclear weapons and have the ability to use them. Um, however, this would be the only this would be the second only time where direct armed action would be taken by one nuclear power against another. And that really begs the question: What in the world could happen if things went really south? Let's say that the Israelis uh, ended up not being able to stop Russian missiles from entering their airspace and critical damage was suffered by the Israeli armed forces and the government, it is entirely possible that the Israelis may actually consider a launch of a nuclear weapon into the Russian Federation, which of course could start a chain of events that would be somewhat unavoidable at that point, and between Russia and Israel, most likely a Western response in uh, account for that kind of an attack, uh, and also a Russian response in response to the West responding on that kind of attack. It could actually end up being an incredibly major ordeal, and this is what really adds the severity to it. It's not the fact that the Russians bite, because we know the Russians bite is incredibly poor. They can't even really fight the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians aren't known for being a cutting-edge military even at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, and even now with a large amount of Western equipment, a lot of their stuff that, is, that Ukraine still uses is still antiquated Soviet technology, and they're still giving the Russians a run for their money, an unbelievable one that really will go down to the books of history. But at the same time, Israel is not that. Israel is one of the most cutting-edge militaries in the world, especially within the Middle East. 
And it, it begs the question, what in the world would happen if something went down in between Russia and Israel? Because it would be a very different picture. The Russians, I believe, wouldn't really even be able to touch the Israelis with conventional means, or even nuclear means for that matter, as long as it wasn't an intercontinental ballistic missile that was being fired, which is highly unlikely because of the range in between Russia and Israel. Even if Russia tried to fire an intermediate range ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead, the chances are highly likely that the Arrow 2 anti, well, anti ballistic missile system would probably end up shooting down that missile before it even um, detonated over Israel. It most likely would shoot it down over Syria and a good amount of, uh, of radioactive debris would be spread around, which has a minimal half-life and also a minimal amount of radioactivity, so it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but at the same time, it, I don't really think anything could happen to Israel from the Russian Federation unless if they were to use an ICBM. So the Russians threat about getting involved in the conflict is really an empty one. There's not really a lot they could do to Israel that would actually impact the conflict or severely hurt them or affect them. Um, but, I hope that I addressed that fairly well with the Russian side of things, because I saw on the video I put out today, some people were saying that I needed to do better research about the Russians in Syria, because the Russians can actually crush Israel tomorrow, which was crazy, because I heard that like over two years ago about Ukraine, and two years later, I'm still covering the war in Ukraine as a full-time job, along with Enforcer Matt. Say hello, Enforcer Matt. Hello. Oh, hello there. Hello. Um, but beyond that... We've been covering this for two years, and we've been watching the Russian military and its forces around the world with great intent, a large amount. And one thing that is very clear to me is that they have absolutely no ability to wage an effective war even at this point in the modern age, and certainly not against the Israelis on a ground level or on an air level, certainly on the air level. But with that... I hope that does address that the best I can, because we actually have to move on into the next part of the Middle Eastern news, or the Iran-Israel war news, which is from the areas around Lebanon and Israel, as Israel did strike today at Iranian groups uh, inside of southern Lebanon, and ended up killing two commanders of Hezbollah. But before we get into that, we do have to talk about the possible uh, response that Iran will have to, to the retaliatory strikes that the Israelis are going to be conducting here soon. It's incredibly evident now that a strike will happen from the Israelis against the Islamic Republic of Iran. The United States is incredibly certain of it. Many uh, Western countries inside of Europe are wildly certain of it. Everyone is incredibly certain an attack will occur. It's just a matter of will Iran respond and turn this from a tit, uh, tit for tent kind of a war like it currently is and into a full-blown <laughs> conventional war, which we think is coming around the corner. A lot of people have been talking about this and a lot of people have been having many ideas on this. But Matthew, tell me, what are you thinking about that? Do you think that the Iranians would start a full blown war over the skies of the Middle East or do you think that they're largely going to back off and not respond? So we asked the audience what were their thoughts about Israel saying they've decided to retaliate directly to Iran and now the IRGC vows to respond with 10 times the force if that's even possible. Uh, but 48% said Iran will respond and start a war, while 29% said eh, Iran will respond, but there will be no war. 11% said Iran will not respond and no war, and 12% were unsure. And on this one, it, the decision's already been made. We've been told by Israeli state media that the decision to strike Iran directly has been made, and the only question is, how's the timing going to work out? And that's the question we're all waiting to see. When is Israel actually going to start launching this attack? Um, and also, we're really honestly not really sure how big of a missile attack this is going to be on Iran or what the uh, Israeli targets will be that they're targeting inside of Iran either. They could go for the nuclear sites. They could simply go for some military sites. There's no way to know just right now because that's being kept a secret behind closed doors. But the IRGC is saying they're going to respond with 10 times the force. Uh, to me, that statement is going to fall very short because we were told that 50% of the missiles launched from Iran into Israel failed before they even reached the Israeli border. So I don't think the IRGC has enough equipment or weapons or missiles to launch an attack with 10 times force. And I think that's pretty strongly worded language. It really has nothing to back it up. So I think Iran uh, will respond, and I think they are going to start a war as well. But it's not going to be something that just ends pretty quickly. It's going to probably be a little bit prolonged. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say that in my opinion, I do not, I'm not entirely sure the Israel, the Iranians will respond. I'm, I'm actually having a really hard time imagining a scenario where the Iranians can actually respond. Because I have a feeling that even if the Israelis conduct a limited strike, because it seems like some are leaning towards they will strike, but it'll be a little bit limited in scope, 
it, it's still the the Iranians probably will not possess the ability to respond. There's not really a lot of ways I can imagine that they can. The Iranians are very limited on their options, while countries like Israel and, and the United States can be incredibly creative with the ways we strike at our enemies. Iran has a very limited way for them to do the same because their weapon uh, weaponry and technology is wildly outdated. We went over this on stream a little while ago, um, actually a few days ago, but I need to show you all the Iranian Armed Forces equipment, a quick rundown at least of the Air Force equipment, because it's it's not a pretty sight by any means. It's, it's a very antiquated armed force. They try their best to be modernized, but there just isn't really any way like this. They call this thing, and let me make sure I get this correct, they call this a rod. This thing is a Molyutka from the Soviet Union, and they can try and make it sound as modernized as they want, but these, this thing was being put onto BMP-1s back in the 60s as one of the first anti-tank guided missiles in the world. So, considering that some of their ground forces technology like that is that antiquated and that old, and then they have a very small amount of modern equipment like the Concours, which we've seen used in Ukraine, to a light effect, it shows that their armed forces is quite old. Their ground forces are just antiquated all around. There's not really a lot to be uh, said or a lot for the Iranians to boast about in that category. But what's even worse is the air defense and also not only the air defense, but the air force as well. Uh, let me see here if I can actually find the anti-air missiles. So we, here's the rocket artillery. And this is a, an example of some of their rocket artillery that they use uh, to fire uh, into, you know, enemy territory, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's just not great. Stuff's not that hot. It's just a joke, man. Like, all their stuff looks so pitiful, like all of it does. But I think one thing we have to also add into the equation is I'm sure that Russia, I'm, I'm mainly leaning toward Russia is going to give Iran equipment and missiles and uh, also ammo as well. Maybe China as well, but more evidence that Russia is going to try to arm Iran than China and they're going to give them more equipment to launch this attack. So, obviously, they've launched a lot of their missiles already at uh, Israel. So, we'll have to see how fast Russia can actually rearm Iran for them to actually pull off a retaliation that they're claiming they're going to try to pull off. I have a feeling it would probably be really tough for the Russian Federation to resupply the Iranians because they're already running into supply shortage issues and are hardly meeting quotas for them to be able to keep up any sustained fire inside of the war in Ukraine. So it would be probably highly unlikely that they'd ever be able to provide the Iranians with a large amount of support because they're already so far stretched to keep their own armed forces running at the moment. They have a little bit, I mean, right now, to make this a little clearer for everyone watching, the Russians have been able to fix the logistical issues somewhat and do have enough ammunition, at least that they're producing per month, to be able to supply their artillery needs inside of Ukraine. But sometimes it still falls a little short, and sometimes they make a min I mean, it's a minuscule surplus, probably several thousand extra shells per month. It's not a lot. Uh, and so they might be able to supply the Iranians with a limited amount of basic tech like that. But cruise missiles, drones, and things of that nature, the Russians certainly will not be providing to the Iranians because they're actually having to draw from um, from circumventing export uh, bans to Russia to try and even produce any missiles in limited numbers. And they're also having to deal with increasingly large failure rates and also dwindling stocks of their own. So I have a feeling they probably wouldn't send a lot of those. But to quickly show you all some of Iran's top-notch helicopters, attack helicopters that could be used, we have the Shahed 285, which is a joke on this channel that we've shown many times. Uh, we also have the older AH-1F Cobras that were provided by the United States back when it was uh, Persia and it was under the control of the Shah. These things are antiquated very much at this point and almost completely unusable. And then finally... Um, we actually have the aircraft, and let me get down here. Uh, we also have the uh, Sofre Mahi, which is a paper airplane. Um, the, these are actually what? used greatly by the Iranians, and we're actually quite scared of these. We don't know how in the world they fly, but apparently we've heard that a large Iranian man flings the thing forward, and it somehow flies. It's a miracle of God. Wait, is this a joke, or is this for real? This this thing is actually uh, what the Iranians say they're making as a stealth, uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicle. And that's their AutoCAD mock-up of, of the thing? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're making that. I'm doubting it. <laughs> I'm on a, honestly, I'm I really doubt it. I, I'm honestly doubting it because with this kind of AutoCAD technology, I'm highly doubting they actually have the ability to produce something like this. You know what I mean? It <laughs> like, looks like something out of Simple Planes or something. <laughs> yeah, it really does. They probably did make it in Simple Planes. 
Uh, but but nevertheless, we have heard that apparently this thing can poke someone's eye out, so this is a great threat to Israel. But beyond that, we do have to look at the serious vehicles that they have. Getting past the unmanned aerial vehicles, let me make sure to get to the uh, Iran Air, De uh, Air Defense Force. We already covered these. They have a bunch of boom booms. They then have some missiles, uh, well, anti-air missiles, but all of them are vintage for the most part or designed off of vintage equipment. They're not going to be that competent. We also know that they have... A very old Air Force. Just to show y'all, they still fly F-14 uh, Tomcats, and these are the premier aircraft of the Iranian Air Force. Nothing beats these aircraft that are in their inventory at the moment. They do have some Su-35s on order, but we understand that those orders have been greatly delayed due to the war in Ukraine and the sanctions that the West has put on the Russians. So they're not really producing a lot of those aircraft for export, so the Iranians will probably not have any Su-35s at all. They do have some MiG-29s, which are incredibly old. Many, many know that have watched this channel about the war in Ukraine. The MiG-29s are attempting to be replaced in Ukraine by F-16s because they're far more competent and capable than anything that the Soviet Union produced. They also have many different variants of the F-5. This is one of them. Um, and also, why in the world is this thing painted up like a Blue Angels? I have no idea. It even has Air Force on the front of it like it's a Blue Angel. I have no clue. Man, I think I'll rip off a paint scheme. It's like, I can understand them ripping off like a design of a helicopter or an airplane because they don't have any good engineers, but like, come on, man, the, the delivery too. Man, it looks old and crusty too. Like it's been on there for like 20 years. It's like, <laughs> get a better paint job. Like, geez. But anyways, they have a whole bunch of F5s. They have some SU-22s. I cannot even tell y'all how old these things are. I mean, these things are incredibly old. Let me make sure to get y'all a first flight date. 1966. Uh, this thing was around for the Vietnam War. So if it was around for Vietnam, I'm highly doubting that this thing would stand a chance against Israel with the F-35s. Uh, they also have some MiG-21s called the Chengdu J-7s. These are the Chinese-built variants of the MiG-21. Terrible planes. Uh, they also have some Mirage F-1s. These, these were all right at the time, but they're incredibly outdated in the modern day. No one would use these things with any common sense. They also have a large amount of F-4 Phantoms. Once again, a Vietnam vintage. Um, so if you think that the Israelis are going to have a problem knocking the hell out of some Vietnam-era F-4 Phantom that, per, uh, that, that Iran has, formerly Persia, I'm highly doubting it. Because even, I mean, even an F-14 will beat the hell out of an F-4 Phantom. Imagine what an F-35 will do to it, or an F-16. I mean, they're going to eat this thing for lunch. The only thing that these Iranian pilots are going to see is death. I mean, that's really all that they'll see is just darkness and nothingness because that's that's all that'll happen. They'll get shot down over the horizon. They won't even see what's firing at them. So largely, I wonder how Iran even gets parts for these old planes, like this F four that we're looking at right here. Like, how do they even source like replacement parts for it? They don't. Uh, <laughs> they they actually, just break and they just don't get fixed. <laughs> they, if if these aircraft break down. They're done. Like, they're completely done. There's no replacement parts to be had. Well, actually, there's there's a little bit of a caveat to that. You know that boneyard uh, that we have, Matthew, down in Arizona in Tucson? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So every once in a while, this is the story, at least, about how some of these F-4s are flying. Every once in a while, some little uh, Iranian agents will crawl over the fence and go into some of the F-4s that were still there when the graveyard had them. It doesn't have them anymore. And they would actually go in there and they'd steal vital components and parts out of the F-4 Phantom and then find some way to ship them back to Iran. That was how they tried to keep some of them flying for a while. Uh, and that's also why, because this is something very interesting... This is also why we end up destroying a lot of these older aircraft and they only exist either in museums or they don't exist at all and they're completely scrapped. So that way foreign countries that end up having our weapons like Iran uh, are not able to end up crawling over somewhere where one of them is still intact and has its parts and end up stealing the parts outside uh, from the inside of it. That's why there's no more M60s. Like, unless if it's in a private collection here in the United States before they were all being destroyed, or if it's at a military museum, there is no such thing as an M60 main battle tank out there anymore because we don't want countries like Iran stealing the parts out of them and trying to use them. Of course, other countries still use them, but that's a whole other point. Uh, along with the F-4 Phantoms, that's also why a lot of F-4 Phantoms out there ceased to exist and they were scrapped. None of them really moved on to any other countries or anything like that because we didn't want them to be able to get the spare parts. Same thing for the F-14. We did the same thing to the F-14. That's why a lot of those don't exist anymore, because they were all scrapped so that way Iran wouldn't be able to try and steal the spare parts out of some sort of a wrecker yard and end up shipping them back to Iran to keep their Air Force flying. 
Um, so, so, so basically, the, the Iranians pull up to the pull apart and they find what they need, and then they try to smuggle it. Man, yeah, they they go to the pull apart and they see this Evor Phantom. And they go, "Who idea? <laughs> we need that, my boy!" And then they steal it and then they ship it back to Iran. So th that's literally what they did. At least that's what U.S. intelligence eventually figured out because it was a miracle for a while that this that these things were flying. And we were like, "How the hell are they still flying?" And then we found out why is because they were somehow smuggling the spare parts back. Uh, to Iran. So now we've destroyed all this stuff. So now whenever these aircraft break down, they've broken down for good. So when one of them breaks down and a critical part just falls apart where the aircraft can't fly anymore, they ground it and then they slowly cannibalize it over time for the other F-4 Phantoms that may break down and they'll take the one part out of this that's functional and move it over to another uh, another F-4 Phantom that may have another broken part in it of that same kind. Uh, so that's how they keep their Air Force running. So eventually over time they will run out of aircraft craft to even use for spare parts and that means that their air force will eventually uh dwindle down into really nothing um so yeah that's how the iranian air force works it's a literal flying junkyard very fascinating maybe one day the united states uh like customs authorities will look in the boxes and see like f4 phantom parts going through the shipyard and think huh I was just like going to Iran and why are the f4 parts just suddenly arriving over there in <laughs> Iran and maybe they might stop it and maybe seize it next time hmm this uh this part for the Landing gear strut is going to walk up to sledding uh, in Afghanistan. Hmm. Well, we'll send that on. Maybe they'll figure that out over there. <laughs> <laughs> but they just have some Iranian guy standing at the port talking about, it's for my car, <laughs> Look how please have it. Dude, he's like, it's for my... Is for my collection, Happy Bee. I collect airplane parts. I, I assure you, there's nothing mysterious about this at all. Uh, but anyways... That's the Iranian Air Force in a nutshell. And y'all can tell that it's antiquated. I mean, there's no there's no way they're going to be doing anything well with these at all. Um, but So, with that out of the way, I have a feeling that the Iranians will probably be very limited in a response. They just don't really have a lot of ways to do it, unless if they do it with the drones and missiles, like I was talking about a little bit earlier. That's why the Iranians or have only that one option so if they can't make it through israeli air defense the first time which is the largest attack that they ever will be able to conduct they are not going to be making it through israeli air defense with the smaller attacks that will be coming in the future iran has no ability to respond in a in a form 10 times larger than they did last time it would physically be unfeasible that would that would suppose that the iranians have available and, and let me three thousand drones and 1,000 ballistic and cruise missiles to fire off in a single attack if it was truly 10 times larger. No country in the world has that kind of stockpile or stores to be able to fire off that number of drones or missiles at a single time. Not even the United States has that kind of numbers to sustain that kind of an attack and then have supplies left over for additional attacks in the future. So going off of this, I have a feeling that they are going to be pretty far stretched uh, in Iran to be able to conduct any kind of an effective attack against Israel, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to try. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that the best I can, at least in my opinion, about whether the Iranians will start a larger war. They probably want to, but their ability to actually do so will probably be greatly limited. Meanwhile, inside of Israel, we've been hearing that the story has been entirely different as Israeli forces are apparently getting a clear answer from the cabinet of the Israeli government that there will be a response on Iranian soil. According to a statement we were able to get today from Channel 13 inside of Israel, in Israel they are looking for a response that will not lead to a broad campaign against Iran. Uh, it was reported this evening on Monday that there is a unanimous decision in the cabinet regarding the need to respond on Iranian soil in the near future. It is increasingly believed that the Israeli response will be net measured. Also, Netanyahu uh, spoke this evening with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and delayed talks with European leaders, including President Macron. Diplomatic sources said that the conversation between Netanyahu and leaders will be coordinated according to schedule constraints, meaning that Netanyahu will be busy until after the attack has happened and then you'll start talking to people about what's going to happen from there. Uh, so, I would largely have to say, it does seem as though the Israelis are hell-bent on attacking Iran directly. We also have heard that Israel has decided how to respond, and we've also heard an additional statement saying that the Israeli Air Force is ready to respond, once again leading us to believe that our original hypothesis that the Israeli Air Force is the one going to be conducting the attack on Iran will most likely be true. We have heard that in Israel, they decided how the reaction against Iran would be carried out. This was published this evening in the evening news in Khan 11. 
Um, much like, you know, the Wrath of Khan from Star Trek, this is the 11th installment of that series. The agreement came against the background of significant uh, differences of opinion. Some ministers demanded to wait for agreements with countries in the region. And that moves us on into our next major bit of news, because the Israelis have actually been trying to create a coalition of countries in the area that will respond against Iran. During recent meetings of the Israeli War Cabinet, the Minister of Defense, Yolav Galan, and Minister Benny Gantz requested to delay a retaliatory strike against Iran until a regional coalition could be established against the Iranian regime. However, a majority of the cabinet believed that an Israeli response should be immediate, with or without coordination or a, a coalition of allies in the region. So it does appear that there's been a little bit of a disagreement at the moment in the Israeli government um, about what should be done. Either whether an attack should be imminent or whether an attack should not be imminent should be uh, should be given a little bit of time to grow so that way they can create a coalition that will stand with Israel in their response. We wouldn't really know who would join this coalition. We're not entirely sure if the Jordanians or the Saudis would join, which would be the most likely of any nation in the Middle East to join. We know that the Iraqis are going to step out and take a neutral ground, at least in this conflict for the while. And we also know that Kuwait will do the same, considering that their proximity to Iran will lead them to having a large amount of devastation um, weighed against them, even if they didn't really want it. We also know that other countries like Bahrain, Qatar, and the UAE probably wouldn't join in as well. And Oman is largely an insignificant country. So and also Yemen as well. So there is really no point in even wondering if they join a coalition or not. The United States might join a coalition, but it seems as though at the moment inside the U.S. government, or at least the office of the president, there's not much of a wish or a will or an ambition to follow through with any strikes against Iran. It seems more so that they are wanting to back off from the situation and also advise the Israelis to do the same. At the exact same time, we also heard that a massive cyber attack has been reported inside of Israel, while there's also a massive cyber attack that's going on on YouTube right now. If y'all don't know, that's actually happening um, right before we, well, actually right when we were going live. That's why our live viewers are only 150 for a short while. But nevertheless... According to reports, a major cyber attack compromised key information centers in Israel, according to the Haaretz newspaper, which reported on Tuesday. According to, report, uh, to the reports, the attackers not only breached the data centers, but also created a website to disseminate the stolen data. It is apparently, um, it is apparently uh, a Hezbollah leaks, uh, or something like that. The Israeli government has provided no information so far, while the hacker's identity remains undisclosed. Uh, so it does appear that there are ongoing cyber attacks inside of Israel at the exact same time and we have also heard that the u.s doesn't know what kind of retaliation the unite uh, that the israelis are going to conduct within the region at least according to cbs uh israel is not sharing its targeting with the united states so the u.s does not know what the form of the israeli retaliation will take or when it will happen and that's according i believe to john kirby earlier today if i'm attributing that statement correctly uh, but nevertheless it does appear as though the israelis are uh making sure to keep things uh, tight-knit, at least within the Israeli government, and make sure to keep all the decision-making uh, happening there instead of allowing other countries to advise them on what they believe would be best. Uh, at this point, I would honestly have to say that in my personal opinion, I believe the Israelis should be given a blank check to do whatever they would want or wish within the region, even if it included a mass strike against Iranian military targets uh, within the next 48 uh, to 72 hours. We understand now that this is an anti-Western front. This is not uh, an ideological conflict in between Iran and Israel. And in at the bottom sense, at the lowest level of the sense, it is uh, the Iranians want to retake Israel and create Palestine out of it. The Israelis want to keep Israel and also stop themselves from being genocided. So overall, there is a little bit of an ideological uh, conflict going on underneath. Well, this ideological conflict gets swept up in between um, the Western interests and anti-Western interests. And that's something that a lot of people do not get when talking about about supporting Israel or Iran. It's not really a matter of supporting the Israelis because you like the Israeli government or you like Benjamin Netanyahu. And of course, we can't speak about politics, but one thing I can say is that the Israeli government did recently go through a soft coup, which led to Netanyahu being reinstalled in power outside of democratic means. That is a little questionable, but at the same time, Israel is far more pro-Western than Iran ever will be. And for that reason, 
I would support Israel in this conflict. Supporting Iran ends up circling us all the way around into supporting Russia and anti-Western interests meant and compromising our sphere, and not only that, leading to the collapse of countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, and uh, the rest of the countries inside of the European Union, and other countries around the world. It is very important, and I cannot stress this enough, incredibly important, regardless how much you like a country or not, that we continue to stick with our allies around the world that are far more in favor of us than others and continue to support them in these difficult times. Because without them, we're not going to have any kind of pull or power in, in the rest of the world. We are going to eventually... Uh, retail or wholesale give away all of our allies one by one because we disagree with them little by little and end up allowing the axis of evil around the world to control practically everything um also another pe another thing that people have been talking about is that a lot of people have been have been discussing what will come out of this conflict especially since the russians are now trying to clearly get involved in the situation some people are saying that it will lead to a major regional conflict. Some people are saying that it will lead to even a major global conflict, a world war. And this will actually be the flashpoint, is the conflict inside of the Middle East. A lot of people have been saying so many different things. But everyone is saying that the end result will be war. But Matthew, what kind of war do you think it will be? A major one or a regional one? And also, what is everyone else thinking about that as well? All right, so we asked the audience, we said, what do you believe is the most likely outcome of the ongoing Israel and Iran crisis? And it looks like 42% said a, me a major regional conflict is the most likely option, while 32% said a major global conflict, and 17% said it's most likely that all parties will de-escalate. And in my opinion, this is just my opinion alone, and you can have your own as well, this is my speculation, I think the best case scenario is we see a regional conflict break out. Worst case scenario is we start seeing other countries like Russia jump into the mix and that uh, really raises the odds of World War III happening because with Russia jumping in, that is a wild card that nobody was really expecting to actually jump in this conflict and that would mandate a response from the West uh, to then respond to Russia's involvement which could obviously lead very quickly to a global conflict breaking out. So if the Russians don't get involved, then we're probably just looking at a pretty pretty sizable regional conflict, which is not totally uncommon for the Middle East, but because Israel is involved and is a nuclear power, that will be a concern indeed. And also, we're not entirely sure if Iran actually does not have nukes at the moment. They might actually have a working nuclear weapon, uh, because they kind of alluded to that today, but they were kind of a little bit sheepish, uh, sheepish about it, and they didn't come out and say it outright. So we'll just have to see, but since nukes are involved, that does make things a little bit more tense than usual. Uh, but Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say that in my opinion, I think that this will most likely lead to a major regional conflict as well. A major global conflict is not unlikely in this scenario, considering that the United States supports Israel and the Russian Federation is now openly supporting Iran. It's not unlikely to say that a full-on world war could happen, because we do see that uh, both sides are largely supporting the other. But I will have to say uh, that... I, I'm not really sure if it will turn into a world war because the United States does currently seem to lack the ambition or at least the uh, the balls, in my opinion, to follow through with supporting allies around the world that are facing down our adversaries. It seems as though we are more into appeasement these days than we are putting an iron foot down. And that's something that I've noticed uh, not just over the past few years, but really over the past decade, is that uh, really the, the U.S. leadership seems to more so lean on the idea of backing away from conflicts or completely avoiding them altogether, even allowing our sphere of influence to be chopped, uh, chopped away at bit by bit. Uh, I'm not going to go into particular examples on that because, you know, I feel like the statement is a, a fairly blanket one really over the past decade as a whole, uh, but I feel like that should stop. It's certainly not doing us any good, and we can see that as this continues on with this uh, attempt at appeasing countries and trying to smooth things over so that way the baby doesn't throw the toys out of the crib, it's getting worse with each passing year. More and more conflicts are beginning to rise up, and that's because countries do not live in fear of the retaliation or response that will come from poor actions, poor diplomatic maneuvers, or poor direct action uh, maneuvers due to a failure of diplomacy. Uh, I would have to say that the United States, I believe, certainly needs to go back to the idea of being a world police 
And of course, being in world police is nasty business. Uh, sometimes it doesn't go that well, like it went in Afghanistan. I think everyone can agree that kind of went poorly over 20 years. Uh, but beyond that, it is a necessary role that we have to take is to win some and lose some trying to beat the world police. Uh, it's it's something that we're starting to note with the United States trying to be less of a world police, uh, regardless of who's in charge. And I will say I will say that regardless of who has been in charge over the past 10 years, and all of y'all know, I'm talking about multiple different people because multiple p different people have been the president of the United States over the past 10 years. It appears that we do nothing but appeasement. I've never seen anyone not do anything that isn't appeasement. Uh, and it, it's starting to show that it does poorly. It does incredibly poorly. Uh, because some of the things that were done as appeasement 10 years ago, like allowing the Iranians to uh, conduct nuclear research and development, we're now seeing 10 years later is creating nuclear weapons. Appeasement to the North Koreans just years ago did nothing, as the Korean Peninsula is closer to war now than it ever has been. The West's general silence on the war in Ukraine or the Russian invasion and occupation of the Donbass and, and Crimea has now led to Eastern Europe being on the cusp of another world war, the, the next one since World War II. All of this appeasement that the West has done over multiple different years over the past decade from many different leaderships here in the United States has done absolutely nothing to improve the Western situation in the world or the situation of furthering world peace, in my honest opinion. Uh, I would have to say, and this is a, and this is largely within the no politics rule because I'm making a blanket statement on everyone, the past three, three presidents of the United States and their ability to, uh, in, in their ability to persuade global peace or really the, uh, the turn of global events has largely been an abysmal failure in my opinion. Not a single one of them has ended up facing down any of our adversaries in a strong way. They either allow crap to hit the fan and then they sit back and, and just take a step back and let our allies or western line countries take a beating, beating around the world or they step forward and end up giving concessions and appeasement before it even gets to that point um i would have to say it's just it's it's just rather annoying to me and i would have to say that i believe that at this moment considering that this is another conflict that's breaking out it appears that without a, a without a strong american involvement this will continue to devolve into a more and more serious situation I would have to say that I believe that American intervention specifically and hopefully a Western coalition intervention would certainly be needed within the Middle East. Now, I believe that if we showed a sign of force in this area, the Russians would most likely back off of their stance of supporting the Iranians. Uh, that's what I would believe, at least in my opinion. Um, but Matthew, do and you have also, and, and also, by the way, another catch as well is I actually tweeted this out on Twitter yesterday. I said, confront Iran now before it's too late. If Iran is super close and they don't have a nuclear weapon just yet, and they're super close to developing a, a one, like we've been told by U.S. intelligence, we should confront Iran now and encourage Israel to tend to the situation right now because Iran is being led by lunatics. And if they could get away with it, they would destroy the state of Israel and knock out that democracy and take over that country if they could get away with it and kill everybody inside the country and then take the land for themselves. They would do it. So if they get a nuclear weapon, that gives them tremendous leverage over Israel because now both countries are on a level playing field. And to stop them developing nukes is imperative that we do not allow them to get those because any other country getting nukes that's more stable, it might be acceptable even though we really don't like nuclear weapons being proliferated. But with Iran being so unstable, we can't have that happen. That would be a wild card like North Korea and we can't have other countries getting nukes like North Korea and Iran. So to me, I think that's why the Israelis are saying that publicly. They're, they're even saying that when they go out to speak in, in uh, events. They're telling people, we might need to go ahead and do this. And I think that's what Israel is sort of weighing into the equation when they say they're going to strike Iran directly. They know that's probably going to start a regional conflict. But they know, like I'm saying here as well, that we have to get those nukes and take them out. So I think it's a wise thing. I think, you know, unfortunately, war is nasty, but sometimes it is required. And in this situation, it might be needed to take those nukes out. And I would agree with that. And also, I've seen some people um, getting very, very vocal in, in their disagreements in the chat. And it's okay to disagree with me if you don't uh, agree with what I'm saying. But one thing I would say is don't be rude because that will lead to a ban. I'm not rude to y'all. If, if y'all ever have a disagreement, I'm more than happy to talk about the disagreements we have and see if y'all can see my side or see if I can see your side. But being rude is an immediate lo uh, loss. It will lead to a ban because that's something that we don't do on this channel. I don't do it to y'all and y'all don't do it to me and no one does it to each other in the live chat. 
Uh, and I've seen some people getting wildly rude, saying that we have absolutely no idea how U.S. foreign policy works, which is a little crazy considering that we do this as a job. And Matthew's actual degree is pretty much in that, and my degree is in history, which is really the evolution of foreign policy over the years, is at least as one of the studies I did in college. Uh, going off of that, I would have to say that the acumen behind our statements is fairly measured. It's not just a couple of kids in a basement talking about foreign policy. And I would have to say that if, if you believe I'm wrong, tell me how in the world what the United States has done over the past 10 years has been good. Where in the world has it led to a good situation or a good scenario? We have seen uh, in another instance the United States back off of our backing of Taiwan since 1990. That goes back 30 years. And now we see that the Chinese are once again poising themselves to try an invasion of Taiwan and to take the country over. Possibly plummeting U.S. Uh, computer industries and technological industries into the dark ages because now the Chinese will have control over the vital wafers and semiconductors that are produced by TSMC inside of Taiwan. It's another quagmire and it's been created because the West has been backsliding off of our... Um, off of our commitments and our dedication to the support of Western allies around the world in an attempt to try and appease countries that are dictatorial regimes, like Communist China, like the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea, like the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Russian Federation, among many others. This is a terrible stance to make. It is an awful one. Now, I'm, I'm totally fine with giving concessions, but I don't like giving them away easy, and I feel like that's what we keep on doing. We either we either sit there, and like with the Israelis, and we let them get attacked on October 7th, and then we go, oh, oh, hey, I wouldn't go into the I wouldn't go into the Gaza Strip, and then Israel goes into the Gaza Strip, and the attacks keep continuing from Iranian-affiliated groups that then strike the IRGC because they're the ones funding and operating those groups, and then the Iranians strike Israel, and then we go again, whoa, hey, Hey, I wouldn't strike at Iran or anything. Let's just play it calm here. I mean, they they want well, you. Well, I, I will say on that real quick, and for you, don't mean to interrupt you or anything like that. But on that topic of encouraging people to sort of like take a step back, I think that is smart. Uh, the only the only problem I have is when like the United States starts threatening people. Like, you better back off. We're going to stop supporting you if you decide to respond and defend your country. That's when I have a problem with it. But it is always wise to tell Israel and like the leadership. Take a step back for a second and think about what you're about to do before you just start launching off missiles. Because even though these leaders are leaders of a country, they still are humans. And they get uh, emotional, irate. They also start thinking about their families could have gotten killed during that attack. And, you know, they're susceptible to human emotions as well. And they could do something extremely rash if someone doesn't step in with a level head and tell them to calm down, respond in proportion. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. And, and But that's, that's largely the thing, though, about this, is that every time the U.S. says, Whoa, hey, calm down. I back off. We always go or else to our own allies. And then they back off because they're scared of losing U.S. support and being left alone to die in the region. And then as crap continues to hit the fan, they're like, we got to respond at this point because the situation's getting worse because you told us to back off last time. And now it's continuing to get worse, so we have to do something. Then we keep on going, whoa, 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 hey, I wouldn't do anything or else we might pull our support. That's ridiculous. We do that to Ukraine. I mean, I don't know if y'all saw this just a month ago because we reported this on this channel, but we sit there and go, whoa, hey, the Russians invaded the Donbass. Oh, I, I calm down a little bit. Take it easy. Or like, we'll support y'all a little bit over the next few years. Just know we're your friends. We got your back. And then Ukraine goes, oh, okay, sure. And from 2014, when that started, when those statements from the U.S. government started, up until 2022, we went, oh, we're your friends, Ukraine. We'll back you up 100% because we don't like the Russians either. And then Ukraine said, well, we'd like to join NATO. And then we went, sure, why not? Let's start the let's start the process. And as soon as we said that, the Russians invaded. And then we went, whoa, hey, well, we can't really get you. We can't really get you any support right now. We know we kind of started this by trying to get you all on NATO, and that was the catalyst to this war beginning. But we really can't get that involved. That might be a little bit too much for us. And then when Ukraine goes, well, we got to fight the war however we can then to try and survive this thing, and they start striking refineries inside of Russia to cripple the Russian economy. Then again, once again, we go, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, you can't be striking refineries. You got to lay back a little bit, although you're fighting for your survival, or else. This is a refine. Okay, so we're back. So YouTube's glitching so bad tonight. Is, I'm telling you, it really is. I mean, that wasn't even lag on our end or a DDoS tag or anything. It's just YouTube giving out. Uh, but beyond that, to get back to what I was saying about Ukraine, we go, whoa, whoa, you got to back off. You can't fight the war to win it on your own. Although we're hardly supporting you, or else Th this type of stuff is ridiculous to me. And we've done this everywhere. You know, it, it's it's happening everywhere at this point because the idea in America, and I saw someone say this. 
is that America does not want to be the world police, and a lot of people in America don't want to be the world police. Well, if you want to keep on living the life you're living now, as comfortably and luxuriously as it is in America, your country has to be the world police, or you end up being a country like any other, which, where it's an okay place, but it's not a great place that has nothing but endless economic prosperity. You have to be the world police to be able to sit sit up high. The British Empire, back until its uh, its eventual fall in the 1930s and 40s, was the best country to live in on the globe, on the face of the globe, because the quality of life for even the lowest classes in Britain was still better than most other countries around the world, until the United States eventually ended up overtaking it around the 1920s, and then the British started to fall to the wayside. Now they're just like any other country. It's an okay place, but it's not great like they used to, because they used to be the world police, and being the world police comes with a lot of huge benefits economically. Uh, but... You can't sit well, like we can't sit there and keep on stepping back uh, in in places around the world. I feel like it is time for the United States to really step forward. We need to understand, and this isn't this isn't a failing. And I want to make this very clear because this is not a political speech of mine trying to support one side or the other. Because I feel like both sides over the past ten years have been responsible for this. So that's a fair political statement because I'm criticizing them both. But I have a I, I feel like U.S. leaders should realize now over the past decade that this kind of appeasement and backsliding to try and end conflicts or, or stop conflicts from happening around the world is simply not working. If a conflict is to be had and it's a worthy one, like we're starting to see these days, conflicts will have to happen. It's an inevitable certainty of the world. We can't keep doing this because it's not producing the peace we're looking for. It's only producing more war and worse wars than we would have had to deal with at the beginning. Uh, and so I hope that addresses that in, in the best I can, at least in my opinion. I don't mean to give my opinion or speeches here because this is, of course, the news, and that's really our job is to tell you all the news. But I just, it's something that I see that I just feel the United States should take far more assertive stances. Not to get us into a war, and a lot of people don't understand that this isn't war hawking or saber rattling or bloodlasting. It's the fact that we just give up so easy. If we didn't give up so easy, even if we just bluffed our way almost into a full-on war, it probably would force them into the negotiating table, whoever we're going up against, and they give concessions. The concessions we're looking for that would end up making us fairly happy and avoid all these conflicts in the first place. That's what we ought to be going for, and we're not going for it. Uh, and I just find it to be crazy. But anyways, beyond that, Iran has says that it has said that it will use a weapon that has never been used before by Iran uh, if Israel strikes their territory. And a lot of people are wondering if they're actually saying they're going to use a nuclear weapon or if they have a usable one at this point. Uh, and so, Matthew, what do you think about that? And what is everyone else thinking about that? All right. And we asked the audience, we said, what are your thoughts about Iran saying it will use weapons never used before if Israel strikes their territory? And it looks like 49% said Iran is just running thy mouth. 30% uh, said Iran is threatening nuke strikes, and 14% said it sounds ominous, but I really need more information. And on this one, I think Iran's goal behind that statement was to allude to potential nuclear weapon usage, but I don't think they have them ready just yet. That's my hunch, but obviously we simply don't know that yet. I'm sure someone out there knows in U.S. intelligence or also Israeli intelligence and are keeping it quiet. I think they're very close to it, but I don't think they have it yet. So I think Iran is just running their mouth right now like they've done with everything else. Uh, Iran proved themselves to be pretty big liars when they said that they were going to stop their attack in the middle of it and then they started lobbing more missiles at Israel. They proved themselves to be pretty hardcore liars just then and they even lied to the UN. Uh, it, that doesn't really mean much to lie to the UN because they don't do anything, but they lied to them. So to me, I think it's just a bunch of uh, bull hockey. It's a bunch of uh, ho hogwash, if I can come up with a better word for it. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say they're running their mouths. It's probably a, uh, a deterrent statement uh, attempting to make the Israelis scared that their intelligence might not be correct and they actually have a nuclear weapon, so don't attack them because there might be a nuclear response. Uh, but then again, that shows that the Iranians are incredibly scared because nuclear uh, doctrines usually revolve around the security or the existence of the state is in an existential danger. So you fire off the nuclear weapon to save the state uh that means that the iranians are saying the israeli strike would be so devastating to iran they would have no option but to fire a nuclear weapon because the existence of the state would be in jeopardy if the israelis struck them which tells you that the iranians are either incredibly fragile uh which it's which it certainly is or they're incredibly scared of the kind of response that Israel will conduct on Iran here in the next few days uh so i hope that does address that well at least in my opinion but 
with that, that is, well, actually, we still have a little bit more major news to talk about inside of Lebanon. We were able to see that in Beirut today, which is the capital of Lebanon, uh, that some unknown orbs were seen flying over the capital. We don't know what they are. They may be fighter aircraft. They may be missiles, rockets. Not entirely sure. But we can see them right here. There are these three little orbs. Oh, there's the aliens. Oh, God! <laughs> We don't really know what they are, once again. They're just orbs up in the sky above Beirut. A uh, fairly normal fare. <laughs> I mean, there's not really a lot that I'm going to read into that. Just wanted to show that to you all. But moving on from that and down into southern Lebanon, we did get to hear that a Hamas Hama a commander was killed by Israel. We were able to hear this today from the Israeli Defense Forces, who stated that commander of Hezbollah's coastal sector and senior official in several positions of Hezbollah's military wing, Ismail Yusuf Bas. Uh, Ismail uh, was involved in the promotion and planning of rocket and anti-tank missile launches towards Israel from the coastal area of Lebanon. During the war, he organized and planned a number of terrorist attacks against Israel. We then were able to confirm that this guy is in fact uh, dead, uh, uh, dead and dead because uh, Hezbollah put up the RIP poster for the guy, letting us know that the guy is in fact dead. That boy tried to catch a missile. Don't ever try to do that. Man, you know, you know, honestly, man, this guy, aw, man. I it looks like it could be his cousin. It looks like it could be. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm just saying. But anyways, still... Really interesting to see that they were able to get a commander of Hezbollah, and it does appear that the Israelis are conducting a fairly large uh, uh, anti-Hezbollah campaign within southern Lebanon and are once again starting to launch larger numbers of airstrikes against their forces. Moving on from that and out of the Middle East, it is now time for us to finally start moving on onwards and upwards towards Ukraine and our next map on the night. Also, another thing I'd like to share with you all really quickly is that we actually have two maps now. We're uh, measuring the Iran-Israel war uh, by the day here on this map that I have on screen. And then on the second map, we're still continuing to cover Ukraine war news. So if you want to find both of them, um, go down to the link in the description below and I have them labeled. Both the links for the Israel, uh, the Iran-Israel war and also the Ukraine war maps, which are both in the link in the description below. You can click on them and you can go and see exactly everything that is happening in both conflicts in real time for the large part. So with that, we're now going to be moving on up into the Ukraine war. But before we do, Matthew, I realized that we have many, a great many questions to answer. Because we've had a lot of people throwing them in. But Matthew, what do we got? And we've got some really good questions. And first up, we have a $50 super chat from the Mr. Anderson, a longtime hey! channel viewer. And thank you, Mr. Anderson, for that very generous support and helping keep our work running. He says, hoping the stream goes well tonight and just wanted to stop in and say hi while I enjoy some tea in my Igor cup. Hey, that's what I'm talking hey! about. He says, please take a question from the chat, LSA, and Slava Ukraine. And thank you so much, the Mr. Anderson for the support, the massive support, and helping this channel to keep on running. The stream, I feel, has been going pretty well. Uh, while YouTube had a reporting problem at the beginning of the stream, I feel like the numbers are kind of being reported accurately now, although I still feel like they're a little bit low. It says that there's 9.2 thousand people here live, but we've gotten 81,000 views in just about an hour and 20 minutes, so I'm feeling like those numbers are a little lower, probably closer to 12,000 live viewers right now, but YouTube is really glitching with the numbers, uh, so we don't really know for certain how many people are actually here with us tonight. Uh, we're we're kind of like running off of a rough estimate, but beyond that, the stream hasn't been going well. Um, still, I want to say hello to you, the Mr. Anderson. Great for you to uh, stop by, stop in and say hello. We always love to hear from folks who are channel legends and old guards and see how y'all are doing. And also, I love to hear that you're enjoying some tea in your Igor cup. Wonderful stuff. And we will make sure to take a live chat question. But before we do, I do have to say, Slavo Ukraine and long live the Lee Spring Army. And Matthew, what do we got for a live chat? All right, and the live chat question is going to go to Mr. Tibbs and Mr. Diggs, a brand new username for a longtime hey. channel viewer, by the way. They said, will Israel be using the F-35s? Why, yes, of course they'd use the F-35s. Why wouldn't they? And I got to say that the F-35, uh, the Israeli F-35s, look really good. I don't know what it is, Matthew, but the Israeli F-35s just look so crisp. Like, I, I can't explain it, but I'll show them. 
So these are the Israeli F-35s. Well, at least one of them right there. I mean, you got to admit, that Ooh. thing looks crisp as hell. Yeah, I got to say, that is very crispy. I got to admit, though, like even though I've known Israel's had F-35s for a while, it's weird to see one of our most high-end, high-tech fighter jets not being operated by us and operated by a foreign country. It's kind of wild to see it. I'm glad they're in the hands of Israel, but it's just, it's just so weird seeing our nice fighter jets out there like that. It is really weird, but you know what was cool about the F-35 is that it was built from the outset to be an export stealth fighter. So there are actually a lot of countries operating the F-35 right now, Israel being uh, one of them. But I got to say, I mean, it is it is extra crispy. This thing is just looking gorgeous. I got to say that that little uh, roundel for the Israeli Air Force on the F-35 also looks pretty clean. Um, really clean, actually. On the looks like the YouTube days. membership badges for like the uh, live chat or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? Uh, maybe we need yeah. like an LSA <laughs> roundel that looks kind of like this. That would be kind of cool. Uh, but here's an Israeli F-35 with a high-vis uh, paint job on it. Uh, you can actually see it has the actual colored roundel on it instead of the low-vis roundel that we see on most of them. Um, but it, I, I don't know what it is, but the Israeli F-35s truly are fresh. I mean, they look really, really good. Uh, so... Massive shout out to that. I got to say, wonderful looking jet. Uh, but the answer to that question that you had, are the Israelis going to be using this aircraft? I would suppose so. They do have a large number of them at the moment, and they are planning on replacing a lot of their uh, conventional air force with these F-35s uh, because it's just such a good all-rounder platform. And not only that, it's one of the few multi-role stealth aircraft out there in the world right now. Most stealth aircraft up till this point were designed with a specific role, like the B-2 Spirit being a strategic bomber, the F-117 being a tactical bomber, uh, the F-22 being an air superiority fighter. The F-35 is the first aircraft of its kind in the world that is stealth and able to conduct a multi-role mission, being able to car uh, carry air-to-air -air weapons and air-to-ground weapons at the exact same time. The F-22 could not do that. The F-117 and the B-2 Spirit could not do that either, so this is really one of the first. Uh, so it is an amazing aircraft. I cannot advertise this thing enough to anyone who is out there in the world, like the foreign minister of the Czech Republic or anything, but if you'll ever get the money in the government, you might be able to, you might want to buy some of these if your country is allowed to, because they are certainly the best of the best. I will not have F-35 defamation here on this channel, De slander against the character of the F-35. There's a lot of people who said that this thing was a waste of money, um, but those that was all nothing but Russian propaganda lies. Because if you look under the if you look under the surface, the people who put out those stories the most was Russia Today and Toss about how the F-35 was a waste of money. And both of those are Russian state-funded organizations that are living in a country that is using aircraft that are a minimum of 40 years old. So I'm doubting that they know anything about good aircraft because they don't have any to even see them. Um, but beyond that, I also want to show y'all, since we're on the rabbit hole of F-35s, I want to show y'all a couple of others uh, because they just all look so good. They even have a website. Oh. Mm. And also, Enforcer, real quick, just got some news. I was checking my sources real quick here, and we got a little piece of breaking news. It just happened about 30 minutes ago or so. It looks like a pretty large explosion has happened down near uh, a Russian airfield in Crimea. And there's also second uh, secondary detonations happening as well. And we actually have video evidence of it. I just reposted on the Twitter. Um, some pretty big either attacks or something exploding down there. Um, and it looks like folks are in a panic. Oh, for real? For real. Oh, in Dejankoy. Wow, that's uh, that's like in the middle of uh. Let me see here, Dejankoy. There we go. That's like in the middle of Crimea, right here. So these are this is where the explosions are being reported here on satellite picture. It appears to be uh, used as a helicopter base uh, for an attack helicopter wing. We can see some Mi-28s. Uh, interestingly enough, right here on the tarmac, along with some uh, Ka-52s. So this is an attack helicopter wing using a. Large amount of mixed variety. We can also see some MI-24s over here as well. Uh, so they really have the whole mix of attack helicopters that you could imagine at this airfield. But beyond that, we are getting a picture and also a video showing that apparently there was an attack at the Dijon Koi airfield. We can also see the POV of the uh, camera person. Apparently they're in this building here looking at these trees. You can see these windows here. And we're looking at the Dijon Koi airfield in this area. Here is uh, a video, and let me scroll down to it. Here is a video of the explosions at the Dijon Koi airfield. Oh, dang. A pretty big one, I oh must say. Oh, my God. It's very bright. Got to wear your uh, welding goggles for that one. What the oh hell is that Lord. going off, though? 
dude, it's a rave over there on the airfield. It's like, dang. It's a very consistent explosion, too. Very bright. I have no idea what kind of... Exp it looks like it's ammo-based because the smoke's white, but I have no idea what could be blowing up over there. So let's look at the... There's a, oh, that's the same one, just a shorter clip of it. Uh, but let's see here. Let me go to profile, and then let me scroll down again. So that looks like the same video, just a little shorter. So let's find out. So we know where the video was filmed. And it was filmed from, uh, let's see here. It was filmed somewhere near the southern area in the, one of these buildings. I think it was this one here. And they were looking towards the airfield this way. So let's see. Let me just go up here. They'll make it a lot easier on my life. All right, so there's the building. There's the airfield. So it's down near this road, and there's a little gas station thing. So this is, in fact, the building. And let's see what uh, field of view they had. So they were looking this way. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's line that up right here. It's right there. I wish we had a ruler. It looks like it's coming from somewhere over here on this part of the base. So let's go down here. You know, I think they hit an ammunition cache at this airfield because where the explosion is coming from, it probably is this building or this facility here that was storing a large amount of ammunition for the aircraft or well, actually the helicopters at the airfield, and they ended up hitting it and ending up to a massive uh, cook-off of the ammunition depot at its subsequent explosion. I think that's what would lead to the white smoke signature, and I have a feeling that when morning comes, we'll probably see the damage full on, and it probably will be that an ammo cache here at this airfield ended up getting hit and blowing up. Uh, so probably with, so because that that explosion was way too consistent and bright for uh, a pretty long duration, and it seemed like it's something consistently on fire and exploding. Oh, there's some uh, audio in that one. Yeah, look at this one. Uh, th this one's got audio. All those sirens. Jeez, man, whatever it was going off, like ammo or whatever, that was a very tall and bright explosion. Well, actually, we can see a little feel of the trees right here. We can't get a distance on that, but let's see if we can see a little row of trees in between that field of view mm -hmm, yeah yeah so it would be this building yeah it would be this building or it would be this one over here one or the other um but it looks like this one's actually more in that field of view if we were measuring it right um let's see if there's anything over here and eh, not really these actually appear to be abandoned so i'm doubting that those are even in use and then nothing out here is being used in fact these look like they've actually been ripped up and abandoned apparently uh so Going off of that, it can only be this building or it could be this one. One or the other, but an ammo uh, cache just blew up while we were live on air at the Dejankoy airfield, which houses a couple of Russian attack helicopter wings uh, at the airfield. But let's watch this clip once again that's got that audio in it, because this thing's showing that extra crispy explosion. They got the slide whistle going and everything. They got the strobe lights. <laughs> yeah, the strobe. Oh, no, you know what that Sounds is? Sounds like ammo. You know what that is? That is 100% uh, the 122mm S8s blowing up. That is what that is. That's what's creating that strobe light look because they're all cooking off and exploding one after the other. That's what that is. But in a second, they're all really going to cook. I'm laying odds that that's not fuel. I saw some people speculating it might have been, but I don't think so. I don't think it'd be bright white like that. Nah, yeah, because that bright white smoke, certainly not fuel. Fuel never gives off a bright white smoke. It's always a dark black smoke. It's the blackest smoke you'll see. Uh, bright white smoke like that, like we're seeing right here in the light, that is 100% an ammunition cook-off. So this is an ammo depot that got hit at this airfield. Come on, give us that supernova like we saw in the first clip. Oh, here it comes, I think. No, actually, Man, I, I honestly, oh, look, they got the announcements going on and everything. They said, <laughs> the the building, quick, there's a big fire. <laughs> but like, I wouldn't put it past Russia for someone to have ended up smoking next to that thing or something. Like, it's possible it was a Ukrainian attack. We don't know yet, uh, but it could have been maybe the Russians messing around. And they set the thing on fire. You never really can't tell what their incompetence. Um, let's see. I would have to say, um, I think so. And also someone said, Andrew, you don't know that go with, I think it's 122 millimeter. We probably, let me, let me check this because I'm, I'm very certain about it being S8s, uh, S8 rocket. 
I'll let me go here. I believe they're 122 millimeter. Let me make sure to check. It's actually 80 millimeter correction. Sorry about that. Uh, I saw someone say that in the chat earlier. I did not catch the name, but thank you for correcting that um, because you're the reason why I wanted to check. But if uh, if y'all don't know, the S8s are usually the most common rockets that are used by every side in Ukraine at the moment, at least for the uh, at least for the uh, attack helicopters. Even the Ukrainians use these things in fairly large amounts. And let me see if I can get y'all a picture of the rocket pods that they're carried in. Maybe I can get one of those. Let's see here. Here we go. Y'all will know them when y'all see them. Um, so as soon as I pop it up on screen, y'all be like, oh yeah! Like, so here we go. This is the S8 rocket pod. And I know that y'all seen these a million times so far in the war. Whenever we see helicopter footage, nine out of 10 times on both sides, this is the rocket pod that's being used. This was most likely a cache of S8 rockets, because you do have to remember that both sides are using their helicopters at this point as rocket artillery. And the most common form of rocket uh, that both sides possess is the S8, which is an 80 millimeter unguided rocket. So it was most likely massive caches of of S8 rockets that ended up blowing up inside of the ammunition cache. They could have been different, but that's a little unlikely because I've never really seen a lot of rocket artillery being used that was any different than an S8 rocket pod, which would use the S8 rockets. Uh, so going off of that, I have a feeling we've been able to bust the case on this one. If we're wrong, we're wrong. And it'll be as simple as that, but it was probably an ammunition cache filled with S8 rockets that ended up exploding. Also, the explosion seemed to be like a small, never ending, massive uh, flame uh, instead of massive, large explosions, which you would see if there were bombs inside that ammo cache. So I think it was nothing but S8 rockets that were in there that ended up cooking off and blowing up. Uh, still deadly. I mean, like, 80 millimeter rockets blowing up in the hundreds, very deadly. Probably even the thousands. Really, really deadly. Uh, but still, nice to see the Ukrainians were able to pull off such a good hit. Uh, but getting back off of that breaking news and into a rabbit hole, I have to show y'all and let me see if I can find it. Some of the international liveries of the F-35, because a lot of them actually look sick. So let me see here. Engine. We don't want to know about that. We all know it's a VTOL. At least the F-35B is. Uh, so here's the British uh, F uh, F-35. It has the low visibility RAF roundel on it. I don't really know if I like that one. It's just a donut, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think the high vis would look better on that F-35, in my honest opinion. Uh, then we also have the Australians who have the kangaroo in their roundel, which is really cool. I think that actually doesn't look that bad. Uh, then they also have uh, the Israelis. You can see the Israeli F-35 right there. Still crisp as hell, I'm telling you, Matthew. Probably one of the crispest ones out there. Uh, and then we have uh, the Norwegian F-35s, so the Norwegian roundel on them. Overall, I mean, really, there's not a big change in livery. It's just a beautiful-looking plane. Um, but the liveries add just a little bit to the overall look. Not that bad. Uh, but anyways, with that... We are now going to be moving on into our next question because we still have to get on into some questions. So, Matthew, what is our second question? Our second one is a $20 super chat from Badger Bro, another longtime channel legend. And thank you very much, Badger hey! Bro, for your support as well. He said, Enforcer in 2015, Russia was doing Russian things near Turkey, and Turkey was doing Turkey things. And a Turkish F-16 shot down a Russian Sukhoi Su-24, and Russia stopped effing around uh, since then near Turkey. And that is actually true. They did end up shooting down a couple of Russian jets. I think they shot down two SU-24s over the course of three days. Uh, and the Russians were really pissed. The Turks said they violated their airspace, to live with it, and... So the Russians ended up actually living with it and didn't do anything in response. Uh, and that is entirely true, Badger Bro. And I got to thank you so much once again for support and helping this channel to keep on running and sharing with us another fact that Turkey does Turkey things. And damn it, no one's getting in the way. <laughs> Not even a nuclear power like the Russian Federation. They are going to shoot down a... They would shoot down an SU-24 and possibly provoke world war just because. I mean, they, they, really, they really are dead set on that kind of thing. You got to respect... Like, while a lot of people don't like Turkey because they do Turkey things, and I gotta say, I don't really like the Turks sometimes because they do Turkey things, you gotta respect Turkey when they do Turkey things, because they don't give a damn about anyone and who they are, it's just that they're doing their thing, and you gotta get out of the way. Uh, so that's, uh, that's funny sometimes, at least to me. But still... Thank you so much for the wonderful support, Badger Bro, and helping this channel to keep on running because it is folks like you who helped to make this thing possible. And if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to be here live on air right now. And so with that, I hope that does address that again. And also, uh, I've understood a lot of people saying that apparently, uh, because I've seen a few people say this in the chat, apparently y'all can't throw in super chats either. At least some of y'all can't um, because of YouTube's glitch. 
don't worry about it. I mean, whether we get support in Super Chats or not, the stream will always run. Um, so, you know, wait for tomorrow. I mean, that may be a good thing. Um, but still, thank you everyone for, for wanting to send in a Super Chat and wanting to support the channel. But I can assure you uh, that even if you can't send in a Super Chat tonight, we appreciate your thought of wanting to send one in. And uh, we just uh, hate that YouTube's having a glitch like that. But still, with that, I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the second, well, actually, the final question of this segment. All right, and that one is going to go to Super Bonker 9000, oh! our in house NAFO member who puts in a $20 support. And thank you very much, Super Bonker, as always, for supporting the channel. And they said, Did I hear someone mention Igor? <laughs> Igor! And yes, you did! You did, Blitz! Igor! Shaka, shaka, Blitz! Um, but beyond that, Thank you so much once again for the support. Super Bunker 9000, absolute legend of the Lee Spring Army and NAFO. Uh, I got to say that it's amazing to have you here. I thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And I thank you so much for supporting this channel and helping to keep on running. And I hope you enjoyed my Igor. But still, thank you so much once again. We are greatly appreciative of your support and helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, it is time for us to get on into the Ukraine war news, which is kind of whack, Matthew, because I just realized it is 1040 now. It is an hour and 40 minutes into stream, Ooh. and the entire thing has been on the Middle Eastern segment. So we're going to be going through the Ukraine war news segment, but I just want you all to know that uh, the stream might be a little lengthy because we're now covering two whole different news segments in one. So there's a lot to talk about. Uh, but moving on into Ukraine, we're going to start off the Ukrainian segment with a nice picture of a Ukrainian Air Force Su-27. Man, that pick goes hard. Look at that. That pick really does go hard. That's that's a fine-looking aircraft. Man, the Su-27 really does look really, really good. I, out of all of the Soviet aircraft and Russian aircraft, well, not really Russian, this is a Soviet aircraft, but out of all of the aircraft the Soviet Union ever made, the Su-27 and the MiG-29 are the only ones that I can say looked good. The other ones looked terrible. All of them did. I don't think any of them looked good. But the Su-27 and the MiG-29 were solid, very, very solid designs, at least on their aesthetic. And the Su-27 looks beautiful in this picture. Um, so, pick goes hard. Feel free to screenshot. We need someone to put the parental explicit content warning sticker at the bottom right of this and then put a grayscale on it so that way we can put that Ukrainian uh, Trap Remix album out that's made up of all the best hits of the war. You know, like that one that goes or something like that. But anyways, moving on from that and on into our next bit of news, we were also able to hear that a major factory broke out in fire uh, inside of Moscow, and it was the main supplier of missiles for the S-300 and the S-400. But alas... News, terrible news, did hit the United States today as the major arms factory inside of Scranton ended up catching on fire today uh, and ended up suffering some moderate to severe damage, at least through some parts of the factory. And that factory in Scranton was the main supplier of 155 millimeter shells in the entirety of the United States. Uh, so we had a little bit of a fire of our own. We don't know if it was sabotage. We don't know if it was a workplace accident. We just heard that there was a fire and there was some massive damage caused to that ammu uh, ammunition manufacturer. And yes, what are the odds of that happening right in the middle of this situation? Like where Ukraine needs a lot of shells, we need to ramp up our production, and then all of a sudden, at a, one of our main uh, artillery like shell manufacturing plants, it has a problem like that. I'm, I'm if there if the damage was any bigger, I would think it was sabotage. But right now, I'm on the fence. Yeah, I would I would have to say I think that an investigation should be launched by the FBI possibly into arson and see if there was any kind of arson that happened. Well, actually, that wouldn't be an FBI deal, at least off the bat, unless if it was believed to be a federal crime, it would probably be the local uh, police department in Scranton or the investigative unit that would do that or the state investigative unit. Uh, but I think that there oh, should be... Oh, Jack, just send the FBI down to Scranton, you know what I mean? I I, I grew up in these streets. I put fuses in the top of the shelves, but beyond that... <laughs> Warren Pop, I uh, used to bang the razor uh, while, while, while you're rusty. Oh, anyway... Anyways, <laughs> moving on from these jokes, uh, I would also have to say, someone is going to say in the chat, because I said manufactory, ammunition manufactory, someone's going to say, manufactory is the word! It is, it is, and I'm here to blow your world. This is in the Oxford Dictionary. Manufactory. It is a word. I'm not even factory. I'm not even freaking kidding, man. It's a word, and I'm dying on that hill. Manufactory is a word. It's an old word. It was like used in like the Victorian era for the most part. But it checks out. It's literally just a factory. It's another way to say it. But I usually feel like it flows much better than just 
factory. Like, if I say an ammunition factory burnt down, that just sounds kind of meh. If I say an ammunition manufacturing burns down, that actually sounds kind of classy. Uh, but anyways, moving on from that and into our next bit of news, we were then able to hear that within the area of Belgorod, some combat operations were underway. These weren't apparently inside of Russia. These were apparently just near the border. But here's the clip. I'm sadly going to have to mute it, but we can see them wandering around. That sounded like a little bit of radio head that was about to play right there. Uh-huh. And we see them wandering around. And also, maybe we can see combat to group team up at the top. Nice. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> group. Group. To group. To group. Oh, and we can see some Humvees pass. Oh, the Mark 19. Oh, what's this? A uh, plane. A helmet chapter. Wow, they pass by fast. We now see the sniper uh, in the rooftop. That Provo sniper will be missing him for sure. Oh, I've got a pair of chandeliers and a brand new khaki suit. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about, Matthew? Uh-uh. Oh, what, what? Dude, you, you like the one, come out, you black and tans, come out and fight. Oh, yeah, I know that one. <laughs> okay, so, so this is another one of the same, like, genre, you know what I mean? Oh, okay. I got you, man. I got to really help you out with getting the like soundtrack down for the trouble. <laughs> so there was a whole soundtrack up there, uh, but we can see the uh, snipers continuing to work near the border. We can see this guy with a nice ghillie suit. Daddy Nowski said, is this channel biased? Only pro West. No, this channel is based. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Just banned immediately. Um, but we can see this guy standing near the stovepipe. He's apparently wanting a nice warm meal. Oh dear. Oh. Oh, it was and show that. Oh, it was just a little boo-boo. It was a band-aid, a, a graphic band-aid. You yeah. know, those type you can get uh, at the store, you know, that have like the wounds and stuff printed on the band-aid, you know? Yeah, to make you look cool, of course. Yeah, uh, but, it always oh, looks cool with a wound. And we're going to be just skipping past ah, that band-aid again. And we're going to be skipping forward to the snipers. Uh, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm actually going to end this clip here because I know that that band-aid looks really rough, but nice to see the border guard teams doing their job. Although a little gritty, you know, like they're doing their thing. Moving on from that and up into the area near Kiev, we were also able to get an air defense report. And we were able to hear that nine Shahed 136s were shot down overnight. Impressive air defense work by the Ukrainians. I got to say now, it doesn't seem that impressive when Israel shot down like 300 to 400 of these things in like one night but for ukraine this is actually really good so good on them great to defend their skies and once again showing and also this is another thing that's really un like unimpressive about the air war that happens over ukraine these days is that this is the best russia can pull off on a nightly basis is like nine or ten of these things a night the the iranians launched 300 400 of them from what we know the Russians launched like 10 of them, and they call that a day. A big attack is made up of about 60 of these things. So, incredibly small. But anyways, with that, we're now moving on into the location unknowns. And we were able to get some very interesting clips today. Starting off with some Ukrainian soldiers who are back on duty. Although they are amputees, they've decided to return back into combat service and fight the good fight. And so, here's the clip from United24. I'm proud of my injury. I was wounded in battle. I was more worried about how my family would find out about it. I took it as if life was trying to play a joke on me. I'm just going to poke fun at it way more in return. The Vikings that are coming! <laughs> the Vikings. This audio is wild, talking about the Vikings are coming. Yeah, man, they, they sat there and went... It's like, the Vikings, they're coming on their long ships, my boy! <laughs> oh, that was you that said that? Yeah! Oh, Wait, I, thought they, I thought that was actually in the song. <laughs> what, it sounded like the song? <laughs> like, what the hell? Yeah, it, was, it blended in with the audio to me. On my, on my end, it sounded like the song was saying that. <laughs> Oh man, dude, I said it because of this right here. One second, let me get back to it. Oh, 
that right there. I was like, the Vikings, <laughs> they're coming, my boy. And then you're like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I was like, why are the Ukrainians including a song about the Vikings are coming? That makes no sense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm getting a kick out of you thinking while I said that. Wow, these all, this audio is wild. This is like, <laughs> anyways, get back into the clip. Ты хочешь туди пойти пить пить що? Був тиждень, де я там пахникав, тому що за week when I mopped around a bit. I was watching videos of Dua Lipa, a British singer, and how they dance there. I thought shit, I'll never be able to dance like that. Не зможу танцювати. Поки мені мені сказали, що Dua and some good people told me, don't be so bloody stupid. Your injury is not that critical, and many guys with such injuries return to the front line and continue their fight. I thought if others have managed it, why don't I give it a try? Man, that seems kind of wild, like tell an injured person, don't be so bloody stupid. That kind of has a little bit of a different meaning. Yeah, man, that really is, honestly. Mariupol was under complete siege, so I decided that I had to get there by any means necessary. The only way at that time was to fly there by a helicopter. While crossing the railway tracks, the enemy spotted us at night. They were shooting at infantry with anti-tank weapons. I mean, my leg. They did not amputate it at Azovstal. It was gone right away. A rocket hit, cutting it off, and continued flying. It severed my leg like a branch, didn't even detonate, flew on, hit a railway carriage, and exploded into many pieces. I also got fragments in my other leg. And here they are. Well, I can only say that it was a blast injury sustained in enemy territory during a combat mission. Once I got the prosthesis, I immediately stood up and walked, and the next day I even bought a motorcycle. I didn't need any further rehabilitation. A week after being fitted with a prosthesis, I jumped with a parachute again. Also, I'm riding hydrofoils. I was wounded during the Kharkiv counteroffensive. The shelling began and we sprinted towards the planted trees. I led the way. Suddenly an explosion erupted. I saw it happening in front of me. Smoke billowing, debris flying. I collapsed and, well, realizing I had triggered a mine. I knew my leg was gone. My comrades pulled me from the trees with a rope. They evacuated me to a medical stabilization point where professional doctors cut off what needed to be cut off, bandaged what needed to be bandaged, and transported me to Kharkiv. During the captivity, there were no regular antibiotics or painkillers. I had to endure the pain. I got an infection and developed osteomyelitis. My leg began to rot, and as it progressed, they continued amputating further and further. Hey, dude, that guy's got my shoes. Hey, he sure does. Those Merrells. Dude, no way. So if y'all don't know, these are, these are like the shoes I've worn my entire life since I was born. I was like born with this like this pair of shoes on. And this guy is wearing the same pair of shoes. I got, this guy's got taste. This guy's got taste right here. I'll tell you that right now. Reaching up to here, but the knee remained intact. Following rehabilitation, numerous surgeries, and the fitting of a prosthesis, I rejoined my team in early summer. Then the commanding officers decided to appoint me as the platoon sergeant major. We're en route to deliver additional ammunition and supplies because the orcs have been relentlessly assaulting our position for the past week. They're deploying equipment, tanks and infantry fighting vehicles. Fortunately, we respond promptly and give them hell.
какая реабилитация была? I had a rehabilitation program. I trained independently, hit the sports ground, then worked out in the gym, and eventually started running with a regular prosthesis. So I kept training day after day, and now I'm trying to be useful too. I've taken up teaching, focusing on tactical firearms training and shooting. I discovered a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gym in Kyiv. When I step onto the training mat, I take off my prosthesis. It's, it's remarkable seeing it stand on the side. And actually, prior to this, I think swimming was the only was sport growling. where I could train <laughs> man, without. Man, he literally went. Grrr. I'll be like, "Hey, bro, get off me, man!" That was the growl I've ever heard. Dude, no, they actually sound like a bear. I would be like, Dude, "Go back!" <laughs> what? Wait, what? Go back to it real quick. Like, I want to hear that again. It's remarkable seeing it stand on the side. And Dude, I would have been like, get off me, man! Oh, <laughs> like I would have, like, no, man, I wouldn't mess with that guy, man. If I was if I was grappling a guy and I heard him growl like that, dude, I'd be like, don't eat me, man! <laughs> I'd be like, don't kill me! <laughs> like the... actually, prior to this, I think swimming was the only sport where I could train without it. Now, on the tatami, it's taking to a swimming pool. I'm free to move and engage just like everyone else. No longer reliant on the prosthesis. I may have lost my foot, but I got two new artificial ones. One still in the fine-tuning phase, the other made by friends in Germany. It has a sporty carbon fiber design and suits an active lifestyle. I use it in combat conditions. Physically, wearing a prosthesis is difficult. It's really uncomfortable. Having to take it off, wash my leg and the liner, dealing with chafing and pain. I am unable to do many things I used to do. But mentally, I'm okay. I've accepted it. Even when my leg was amputated, I thought, it's a tolerable amputation. I'll have a prosthesis. I'll be a cyborg. My comrades knew how much I loved my job. They understand that life, in a way, took it away from me. They were more upset than I was. That's why I supported them. Played football at the base. If I could turn back time, I wouldn't change a thing. I would have done the same, flown again, taken a different scope, and eliminated even more of the enemy. The world of the future for me is, first of all, a world without empires. We should explore other worlds, settle on different planets, and think about how we can evolve. With two children of my own, I want them to grow up in a country that embraces European values and progresses in development. Ukraine is my homeland, where I was born. It's hey, my Matthew. home. Dude, no way. That's the same EO attack that Andy L gave us. Hey, it sure is. Yeah, the exact same model. I'm not sure what the model number is, but it's the exact same. Yeah, how cool. My homeland, where I was born. It's my home. I won't give up my home just like that. And that's the end of the clip from United 24, but showing us a little bit about amputees in the Ukrainian Armed Forces, which is an incredibly interesting and a very brave story by these folks to overcome such a severe dehabilitation and yet continue to, to really thrive, uh, even with that in their in their way and as an obstacle. But with that, moving on to our next clip, we also get to see some training of the 155th, uh, 115th Mechanized Brigade uh, happening behind the lines just today. We were able to see some pictures showing them once again clearing trenches. Nice AK-74 right there. Uh, we also got to see uh, them uh, trying to learn what looks like maybe some close quarter tactics, but overall, pretty cool. Moving on from that, it's time for us to talk about the Russian casualty report, which has been incredibly high. Ooh! Oh, oh. lovely. And let's see here. Um, it doesn't look like it tells if, if any Bobcat skid steers are destroyed, unfortunately. I don't think any were destroyed, according to this infographic today. 
Very unfortunate. But beyond that, 920 Russian soldiers were wounded and killed over the past 24 hours, along with nine tanks destroyed, 13 armor, uh, well, APCs destroyed, uh, 16 artillery pieces, one air defense system, 11 drones, and 53 supply trucks. Overall, a pretty good day. Moving on from that and on into our frontline news, we were also able to see a lot going on there. All the way up in the northeast, we got to see the 118th TDF in Luhansk conducting some uh, actions against Russian heavy equipment in this clip. We can see them going after a Russian tank. And also, y'all, I am so sorry about this because it is actually almost 11 o'clock now, two hours in, and we are still a good ways, uh, in, like, beginning the Ukrainian news segment. Um, I'm going to have to try and figure out how to rework the streams when we have major news in two different fronts because my news collection tonight was actually really quickly done. It was done in about 30 minutes, but I really worked hard to try and figure out how to get as much news in this as possible. And it actually appears that it was too much news uh, because the news segment is only supposed to be about an hour and 40 to an hour and 50 minutes long at its longest and about an hour and 30 minutes at its shortest. Uh, we actually try and plan, well, actually, whenever I'm making the stream, I always try and plan that out so that way we have kind of a running schedule here. So the news is not over yet. We still have a lot more to go. But when you see them continuing to hit Russian vehicles, leaving them in smoldering piles, and although there isn't a lot of action in the northeastern front at this moment, the destruction of these armored vehicles ensures that if these units ever get relocated into an active part of the front line, uh, they most likely will uh, not be as effective as they've already suffered high losses in more quiet areas of the front. Also, Barry Woodward said, perhaps two different streams. Uh, and that would be a good idea, but the thing is, is that we, would, uh, we, we wouldn't even physically have time for that most days. Because uh, today, for example, to kind of lay out the itinerary, I wake up at around 11 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Sounds really late, but y'all understand here in a second that it's not too late when you put it into perspective. But woke up at 11, uh, got downstairs, and from 12 o'clock to, I believe it was 2.30 to 3, I worked on the short war video that came out today, which a lot of people loved, and we were happy to see that. Uh, then, right after that, I then um, got in my car with all of the remaining flags that we had to be shipped out, all of the international orders, and those got shipped out today. That took from about 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock, and then I came home, and then I ate supper from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and then from 5 o'clock up till stream time i was working on um some other things behind the scenes that ended up taking a lot of time uh and then also working on the stream itself then the stream went live and we run this from uh nine o'clock local time all the way up until about 12 or 12 30 at night and then after that i am then spending a few more hours most times at night working on some other things and then end up going to sleep around four or five in the morning and then i sleep from four or five in the morning until about 11 or 12 the next day and then wake up and repeat this all over again wash rinse and repeat so sadly there wouldn't be enough time in a day most times to be able to make two streams we'd only really be able to make the one and try and combine everything into it also i'm seeing some reports here that air base that was hit inside of crimea we're being told it could be an actual hit by ukrainian air forces um, it appears that it might have been Zircon hypersonic missiles that were being stored there. They got hit. That's no a possibility. Way. We we haven't confirmed that yet, uh, but some preliminary sources are claiming that's the case. So if that is true, that is a big win for the Ukrainians for sure. That is a major blow, an incredibly major blow. Uh, but we'll have to wait for that news to be confirmed with some, well, hopefully some sort of picture, ev uh, video evidence of the debris that came out of the explosion. Because a, Zer uh, because a load of Zircons getting hit, that would be nuts. There's hardly any Zircons out there, but maybe it did actually happen, which would be a miracle. But moving on from that and into the area of Chernobyl, we also got to see the Shadow Unit, the Shadow Wizard Money Gang, hitting Russian forces in the fields uh, outside of the Severonsky Forest. Oh, yeah! <laughs> that music was kicking! Oh, he fell. Oh, and we see another Russian running away from the Granaten. 
And we're not exactly sure, Barry Baldrinath. Uh, Matthew said missiles. I was thinking when he said it, possibly Ukrainian aircraft, like an SU-24 flying a low-level mission deep behind Russian lines. Uh, we don't really know, but I would assume that it may be missile forces. That would be the most likely. Um, so with that... Oh, yeah, yeah. It's 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 most likely missiles. Like I really doubt it's a air mission back there. Uh, when I said uh, Ukrainian air forces, I meant most likely missiles. So I kind of misspoke a bit. But we're probably looking at... Probably Storm Shadow Missile or Scalp EG, something like that. Uh, that probably struck that. If it was indeed a Ukrainian attack, we've got to get that confirmed, first of all. Also, um, I would like to thank everyone who has joined the channel today. Just a quick shout out while we watch the Shadow Unit continue to dismantle this Russian uh, unit in this area near the Corona Forest. I'd like to give a shout out to the 1.4 thousand people who have subscribed to the channel today. And I'd also like to thank everyone for watching tonight. There's been 101,000 views so far on this stream, and we still got a good amount of news to cover. So uh, welcome to everyone who's brand new. Welcome to the Enforcer channel. Welcome to our community, the Lee Spring Army, and welcome to the stream. I hope y'all are enjoying it tonight because it looks like 101,000 of y'all have. When we see this Russian soldier here, he's, oh, Bliat, I'm stuck in the street, Bliat. We can see another one here. I'm just going to walk around. No pressure, Bliat. No pressure. Do I want to get in the trench? Maybe. Bliat. He disappears. And we see another Russian up here. Oh, Bliat, the suck it, Bliat. The drone, Bliat. I turn and shoot the drone down, Bliat. But he hit anyway. In the second one here too, Bleed. Oh, Matthew, it looks like the hit dog man uh, April ended up getting a schmack very quick. <laughs> so he ended up coming in. He tried, new, he tried a new troll tactic, Bliat. He came in and said, who is this person? Who is he? Is, he? is he the guy who does all of this and this and that? I said, no, no, no. You're confused, bot. He, the hot dog man's the man who defames people and lies like a dog. That's no, why no, we call no. him hot dog, because he's dog. He is the man who takes a vacation as expensive as trucks he provides. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> moving on. He's also the man who has truck towed and has to go get it back from the junkyard. Mm, and given the wrong apartment. Oh, very bad. <laughs> moving on from that and into the next clip. We also get to hear of a new use of the prosthetic leg. Now, while we got the very inspiring video a second ago of the Ukrainian soldier with the prosthetic leg, this man honestly sold me on the prosthetic leg. Observe. <laughs> Legend. <laughs> And I gotta say, so, that is that's actually really cool right there. I love to see it. And you know, it, it looks like this. It looks like everyone's always trying to joke and laugh and have a good time in Ukraine, even through some terrible moments like becoming an amputee. Even this guy is still having a laugh and joking about it. And you gotta respect that sort of stuff. But with that, we are on to the next clip down in the area of Bakhmut, where we got to see the Russian pit. This is a Russian dugout. <laughs> Oh, bleat, but if everything's upset, damn bleat. Oh, bleat, everything ammunition. Oh, bleat. Oh, damn What the damn? Do they got enough AKs down there? They're the, 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 the dead. Oh, he's sitting on top of them. Picked him big, bleat. Oh. Oh, look, so so they actually make you sleep with the dead. They're getting you used to what you're going to become in Ukraine. The fixed will penetrate in two places. <laughs> that sounds like Chris's man. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, we see he's penetrated here. We, we feel the, you feel the big with sin. Projectiles pierce through it. Yeah, some shit went through here, Blade. They hit with some shirts that penetrates. That's called a BAM, dumbass. They usually use those in war. <laughs> it's confusing, you know? Here, penetrates through, Blade. This is our hitch. 
Летит, братан. Something's coming, bro. Look at the hatch opened. We, we pepped it up uh, with the shovel. The hatch is about to blow. Let's see, a fortune teller? I see no point staying here. Then why don't you leave? They'll throw a grenade from above and we're done, boy. We can't do anything. And let me really quickly check. Did they ever throw the grenade from above in the rest of the video? Uh, no, I had to check. <laughs> I had to double check. Oh. Oh, Blitz! Oh! They did! <laughs> they did the hitch again. They're targeting it, Blitz. <laughs> oh, my God. We should pep. We should pep up the shovel, Blitz. That's the end of the clip. But overall, not a bad player, not a bad. But moving on from that, and down into the area of Divka and Drivka, I mean, we got to see the... Oh, oh, actually not safe to see! But a little, ah. little Chinese, you golf got to get them blown up. No, why not? But here's the end of it to make a life true. Here we got to see the Ukrainians destroying some supply trucks. Now it's home. Now it's home. Anyways, when you see them going for the Kamas in the convoy, <laughs> bad luck, Charlie. Ooh! Rest in pieces. Down with Kamas. <laughs> free, free Kamas. They did nothing wrong. They're just <laughs> terrorists, that's all. But we can see them hitting another one. Ooh, right on the tarpaulin. This was cup. a good boy. He never hurt anybody. Man, they didn't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Free that man, Hamas. Man, all 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 Hamas did was massacre some civilians. They didn't do nothing wrong. Man, that's the kind of that's the kind of arguments I've actually heard on the internet. They're like, they only killed a few thousand. I mean, that's no big deal. It's like. Wow, okay, I guess we're all for uh, genocides now, as long as they're small in scale. Uh, but anyways... Can you believe people actually defending, like, Iran, Hamas, and Hezbollah? Like, there are Americans out there that actually defend those groups. Like, like, like the Hezbollah and Hamas wouldn't want to kill, like, Westerners in, like, a split second. It's like, that's their whole ideology, is they hate Westerners. And you live in the West, and you enjoy the Western freedoms, and you're rooting for... You're basically rooting for murderers that would come and murder you, too. Yeah, I mean... You know, like, what what I say, what I say, I'm, I'm not one of those people who say, well, if you like it, go and live there, but take a vacation there. You know, see see how much they like you when you go. Uh, because if you're an American and you like Iran, they ought to like you. I mean, y'all are one and the same, right? So go over there and talk to them. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll agree with you. Maybe, maybe you'll make great friends. I remember a group of people, Matthew, remember those people back in the day who said, we're going to bicycle for peace through Iraq. And they were Americans, and then they ended up dead before the end of it because, uh, th because it turns out uh, ISIS didn't like them that much when they started bicycling through ISIS lands. Uh, so it's like, huh, guess the whole biking for peace thing wasn't that good of an idea. Maybe they didn't like it much. I don't know. Um, Man, they were cruising for a bruising, and they kind of got the bruising. <laughs> oh, no. But but like that that's the thing that a lot of people don't get in America. That's that's one thing they always don't get that isn't realistic from uh, some people. Like I get the idea, world peace is great, ought to be achieved someday, hopefully. But it, it's not now. It, it, that moment isn't now. And I I don't get people who are like, why can't we just all get along? This is like you might want to get along, but they don't want to get along. Okay, it's like it's not our problem that they're not wanting to get along. We got to deal with it though. You know that's how it works. Uh, but anyways. With that, we are now going to be moving on into our next clip down to the area of Krasnarivka, where we got to see a failed Russian advance. And we see the Russians rolling here. We see them moving on in. This, this doesn't look good. This is a build-up, y'all, to something even funnier. This looks really stupid. I can tell it right now. Oh, yeah. It's really stupid, but it's, 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 it's building up to a fun crescendo. They're a little bit too uh, optimistic, a little bit too uh, gleeful with this. They're just all bouncing around, all happy. Look at that. And also, uh, someone said, um, let's see. Someone said, oh, wait a minute, someone said they're not talking politics. No, that's not a political thing, because honestly, uh, on both sides of America, there's groups of people who just hate America. 
because of the other group and they act like it's the worst thing to live in the United States to all of them. It's like to the people who think the Russians are good go take a trip to Russia, go take a actual vacation there, go see what it's like. Like I I'm I like, hell, go stay in the most luxurious hotels and everything. You're still going to be spit on by the local Russians, like literally spit on because they hate you because you're an American. They don't care if you like them or not. Uh, so why in the world root for a group of people that hate you anyways? I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And if you like Iran or you like Palestine, go there, like, you know, go to the West, Bank, go to the Gaza Strip, go to in or go to Iran, go check the place out. I mean, I'm not against it, you know. Like if if they like it, maybe they got a reason. But I think they ought to go over there and take a trip just to make sure. What will they say after they get to Iran? What um, do you think they'll say? Please don't hurt me. <laughs> please don't. Please don't. No, they'll say they'll say Iran. Oh yeah, <laughs> man. You know because, because I ran for my life. Because I'll say this, y'all. I'll tell y'all the countries I like. I like America. I like Britain. I like the European nations. I like Japan. I like South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. Am I scared to travel to any of those places? Absolutely not. Will I eventually try and take a vacation in these countries? Hopefully so. And I feel completely fine saying that because they're our friends. And I know they like us fairly well, or at least they're indifferent to us. Some of them are. And I'm not going to get uh, beaten or killed if I go to those countries. That's what I, that, that's my, that's my point. All right. And I rest my case. Uh, but we can see some Russians here, actually. And uh, that's the end of the clip. But with that. It's time for us to move on from that clip and on into the next one down near uh, Novomikhailivka, where we got to see some more burning Russian tanks. And they were Russian for Stalin. And we can see here the tanks roasting. Also, I'm sorry, made in Canada. I would visit Canada too. It's just that... It's just that Canada, like, for some reason, Canada and the United States to me are, like, one and the same beyond the natural beauty side of things. I feel like they're really the same countries, just with different flags. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't mean on the government level, because I know that Canada's, like, a parliamentary government and all that stuff. Uh, but I mean, like, on a cultural level, like, almost the same, like, the same cars, the same stores, the same buildings. It may as well be, like, the U.S. may be Canada, and Canada may as well be the U.S. Almost one and the same, in my opinion. Um, but moving on from that and into our next clip, Matthew, they're actually mass producing the barn. Like the, like the, the first one was destroyed, but they've now created a second one that is in use on the front lines. So they are actually starting to mass produce the barn. Oh my God. Oh man. They're doing the same thing. They're escorting it around. <laughs> yeah. Look at it. <laughs> Dude, that looks so stupid. Oh. Look at that. <laughs> All right, get on the bus. The bus is here. Burm, burm. <laughs> that just starts rolling. Oh, my God. <laughs> Dude, that looks so stupid. You know what that looks like? It looks like a Wallace and Gromit creation driving around. It's like, what the hell is this? It reminds me of like a little like crappy off-brand version of the German mouse. You know, everyone, Matthew, everyone's talking hot crap until the barn goes rolling down your street. <laughs> Dude, it's the attack of the Amish. <laughs> I pull up the pull up the German uh, Panzer Mouse. Oh, uh, let's see here. Do you want me to pull it up in the smart way, or just call it the mouse? The Moz uh, M A U S. We're gonna call it the Panzer Eight, so that way we can sound all technical. But this is the there mouse. it is. <laughs> Dude, the freaking man. This barn. is this is like the this is the upgraded version of the Russian blasphemous tank. <laughs> this is it right here. Dude, it really it is, man. Also, you want to know something funny, Matthew, about the about the mouse, the only one that exists? Let me see if I can show this to you. Uh, let's see here. I'll, I'll have to... Oh, dang it, man. They don't have a good picture of it. All right, so you see those holes in the front armor right there, you know? Yeah. Okay, so when the Russian, when the Soviet Union came up on this thing, you know what their first thought was? They thought, it's uh, it's a uh, goner, Bliot. No, they said... Damn, that thing looks kind of cool. Let's shoot it. And they started shooting it to see if anything could pin the front armor. And it turns out nothing could, actually. Nothing they had at the time could end up getting through the front <laughs> armor. Uh, so that's what they actually tried. It's like, yeah, nothing makes it through the front armor. This thing's built like a bunker. I mean, like, it, it would take a bomb to blow this thing up, you know? Like, stupidity. Someone, is says, someone says the German house. 
<laughs> yeah, it's the dude. It's the house, dude. That's what we're calling this thing from here on now. We're calling this thing the house over here. The H A U S. It's the house. Look at the house. <laughs> the Russian house. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't I'll see that. Man, look at that house getting all up through those trees. Man, look at that thing. And what's up with the cuts on this video? It's like a music video. No, it's not even a music video. It's just the cuts they have. <laughs> Oh, oh, it almost got hit. Oh, my God. It almost got <laughs> Dude, look at these. Yeah, why are they driving in circles out here in the same spot? They're, like, trying to get hit. Dude, they're like, hit this. Okay. <laughs> and then they start rolling the house <laughs> away even quicker. Oh, man. Dude, I would hate to be the guy driving this thing. Because if it gets hit, actually, you know, there's no way out. You're stuck in there. Yeah, really. It's like that'll become your permanent house. Man, it's the house. Uh, but with that, oh man, we're moving on to the next clip a little bit further down where we got to see the 68th Brigade using some of those sweet, sweet Turkish shotguns that everyone craps on in America because they're like, honestly, no one really likes these things. No one really likes Turkish guns for some reason in the United States. I haven't had a lot of experience with them to know why people hate them, um, but we did get to see them in use by the 68th Jaeger Brigade, which is pretty cool, pretty neat. Pretty cool overall to know they're starting to use 12-gauge shotguns. I feel like it's more for an anti-drone role, maybe even an anti-infantry role, considering that a lot of the fights that they have with the Russians are close in in the trenches or inside of urban environments where the uh, where the distance to an engagement is incredibly short. This might actually be a pretty good move for the Ukrainian units that are fighting in those kinds of conditions is to start adopting shotguns. Uh, a lot of people also misunderstand the range of shotguns shotguns actually have an effective range i believe out to 200 yards so it can shoot a fairly good distance it's just that in a normal battlefield scenario that a lot of militaries would think of doctrinally the usual firefight happens at 400 yards so at that distance the shotgun is completely ineffective but within 200 yards a shotgun is effective and lethal uh using buckshot but moving on from that uh, and out of that area, and a little bit further down the line, we got to see that near the area of Robotne, things were not going well for the Russians today. Here is a video made by the Russians of the of the events of the Russians today. There's a destroyed BMP. <laughs> We see them driving past another. Man, Alan Doherty trying to hook you up with that bread. <laughs> like, Man, I was like trying to figure out, like, is, he, is, he, is he telling me about some bread or is he trying to sell me some bread? Six cents, not a bad deal. Six cents? I, I buy a slice. Must be from some of that Wanda bread. <laughs> Man, I wonder about that bread. Oh, look, a destroyed truck. Saxon soldier said that shotguns uh, are ineffective past 50 meters. One second, I gotta pull that up. How effective? Um, wait, hang on. Effective shotgun range. Let me make sure because I remember knowing. Let's see. Shotguns have an effective range of about 35 yards of a buckshot. Oh yeah, actually, it is actually fairly short. Uh, for some reason, I swore. Hang on. Um, and well. Okay, so with a sabo slug, a saboted slug in the rifle in a rifle barrel, it has an effective range of 150 yards. Um, but with buckshot, it's only um, let's see, 35, 38 yards. That actually is not a lot. Uh, that's actually incredibly short. Uh, for some reason, I remember someone saying that a buckshot could actually travel out to about 100 to 200 yards and still be effective. Uh, but that is completely wrong. So I'll have to go back and revisit that information and, and change that in the future. Thank you for correcting that. But moving on from that and towards Sherbaki, we also got to see some Ukrainian f farmers farming and shelling. <laughs> Man, we can hear that Polish song about buying crocodile in the background, and we can see them driving away as <laughs> artillery shells are exploding out in the distance. And that's the end of the clip. Uh, but with that, that is uh, what the Ukrainian farmers are dealing with in this planting season. And moving on down to the area of Novokokovka and Krinky, we got to see how uh, Madyar takes out Russian artillery. Observe. Four flowers, a bouquet, because it's a red rose. Four flowers. 
армии улова экипажу пилотию ФПВ Обубасу команды Климы Птахів Мадяра. Выведение с БГ одночасово четырех причепных гармат 152-го калибру за допомогою дрони, дронів ФПВ. Видите, они себе фигуам тут влаштували, таке ніби не все життя облаштувалися. Знаете, чому? Потому что эта химера гепая дуже сдалеку, 28, а иногда и 40 км. Тож ФПВ до них зазвичай не долетают. Але не в нашем случае. Man, they flew that thing right in there into the breach. Look at that. They're going to load it. They're going to load it with the drone. Механизм армати, котру дуже важко знищити, а ось вивести з воду, то все тое діло. І Бойк, тут я цінтів книжку з арматами МСТА. Обидві гадки 152-го калібру потужні лярви. Дуже багато хробачня настало на якісь, які розпорки у неї. Тож, поки рука не збита, треба всіх їх коцать. Знищити ту гармату практично неможливо. На ній нема що коцать. Бити там в казенну частину і таке інше, то все тупити одне місце. А ось бити у противідкотний, пуф, противідкотний механізм. Твої гармати, це значить твоєї right готовності на тривалий проміжок часу, поки хробачня буде ремонтувати на позиціях. Йдемо до третьої гармати. Ремонтувати на позиціях ті приблуди є витратно і небезпечно. О, oh мій Лорд! Але і запастин oh. не вистачає, адже війна тривала, а то все дуже швидко випрацьовується. Відповідно, казаки, вважайте це моєю суб'єктивною думкою, ось з поточного досвіду, ми в казенну частину не лупимо. Коли ми півіхами гармати крупнокаліберні заходимо, ми лупимо завжди той противідкотний механізм. І потім спостерігаємо певний проміжок часу, святу тишу на ділянці, звідки хробаки не можуть до нас оп 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 чуть не втратила але то нормально і пілот його вберіг тут треба тонко працювати бачите такі зазорчики ще й сіткою замаскована та задня частина гармати адже та й ходім до четвертої швиденько покажу 15 квітня спекотніший день на півдні 28 градусів сьогодні так так робочня у захваті як ми літаємо Прямо над землею у їх царині. Нічого нас з тим поробити не може. Вони тікають, як і має бути. То є четверта за сьогодні влуплена одним екіпажем FPV команди Кліми. Четверта гармата хробача за один день. То є супер. Вони всі не знищені. Ще раз підкреслюю, щоб не було спекуляцій. Вони є вражені, вони виведені з бойової готовності. Вони не спроможні виконати бойові задачі. А робота на такій глибині дронами FPV – це і є мистецтво. І з цього, це був кінець кліпу тут. І дуже цікаво побачити Мад Йорс Бердс продовжують робити свою роботу в цій області Кренкі. Мені ми також маємо побачити Магарет Нейвел дрон на Одеса. Ой, давайте дивимо це Магарет Нейвел дрон! І там він є, прямо там в воді. І дивимося, що йде! Man, that thing sounds like a, just like a jet ski. It sounds like it's got the big motor in it. Man, I bet you it is a jet ski. I think it is. And with that, that is the end of the clip right there. But I do have to say, Matthew, that drone is impressive. It's cool. It's neat. And with that, it's time for us to move on. It's time for us to move on up to Kiev. Because at 11.26, way, way past schedule, almost an hour extra long uh, segment of news today, it is time for us to move on into that Jimmy. famous thing that everyone knows, and I'm not, I'm not listening to that freaking audio track. It is the speech from President Volodymyr Zelensky here on day 783 of the news of the war in Ukraine. And so, without further ado, here is the speech. Speech! Ukraine, Ukraine. Головне за цей день. Перша була доповідь Сирського і Умірова. Наша фронтова ситуація, наші захисні дії, 
Завдання очевидно – максимально стримувати російські штурми та відбивати кожен удар окупанта. Друге була доповідь керівників спеціальних служб, зокрема голови СБУ і правобезпечення від внутрішніх загроз і, звичайно, про дії наших спецслужбовців у захисті України від окупанта. Зараз можна було побачити, що українські спеціальні служби дійсно ефективні у знищенні ворога. Я хочу сьогодні особливо відзначити результати воїнів Центру спеціальних операцій А Служби безпеки України. Вони ефективно знищують російські ЗРК. Дякую. А також відзначу співробітників 13-го управління військової контррозвідки СБУ які роблять все, щоб знищити російську здатність тероризувати Україну. Знищують російські радіолокаційні станції, які, зокрема, працювали для російської авіації та бомбардувань керованими авіабомбами. Знищимо абсолютно все, що є по Україні. І я дякую кожному нашому воїну Служби безпеки України, усім спеціальним службам, та підрозділам, які роблять все для захисту нашої держави і людей. Третє. Провів підготовчу нараду секретар РНБУ, СБУ, Мінцифра, Офіс. Зараз готується на розгляд РНБУ питання щодо загроз безпеці нашої держави, нашого суспільства через поширення онлайн-казино та неконтрольованість цієї сфери. Всі можливості у цій сфері Маніпулювати людьми та шкодити інтересам суспільства мають бути і будуть заблоковані. Важливо сьогодні сказати і про автора відповідної петиції. Петиції щодо обмеження онлайн-казино, з якою почалась дискусія зараз. Це був український воїн, молодший сержант Павло Петриченко, воїн 59-ї окремої мотопіхотної бригади. Вчора він загинув в бою. Ми співчуття рідним та близьким, усім друзям Павла. Життя всієї нашої України складається із життів і прагнень, волі та здобутків саме таких наших хлопців і дівчат. Багатьох, хто не уявляв і не уявляє Україну без своїх власних дій на її захист, на її розвиток, на її зміцнення. Всі ми маємо пам'ятати, що Україна – це люди, яким не байдуже, Дійсно, не байдуже, що буде з Україною. Ми маємо завжди пам'ятати кожну таку людину, завжди підтримувати кожну таку людину і все робити зараз, щоб наша держава вистояла проти окупанта і захистила свій народ та свою землю, свою незалежність. Я впевнений, так і буде. І ще одне. Працюємо щодня без жодної перерви заради більших наших можливостей у світі у наших відносинах з партнерами. Працюємо заради того, щоб отримати більше реальної допомоги, заради того, щоб досягти справжньої рівності у захисті від терору, коли і для нас тут, в Україні, в Європі і в інших частинах світу діятимуть однакові, дійсно рівні правила. Коли ми стикаємось з однаковими проявами терору, однаковими ударами ракет і дронів. За ці два дні ми вже чого лише не чули про різні конфлікти тут, в Європі і на Близькому Сході, різні рівні загроз, різний повітряний простір, хоча однакові шахеди та балістика. Про різні загрози ескалації, але хіба життя людські різні? Хіба різна гідність у людей? Ні. Однаково кожне життя ми цінуємо, повинні цінувати, повинні захищати на одному рівні від терору. Україна зробить запит на скликання засідання Ради України НАТО щодо захисту неба, постачання ППО, відповідних систем і ракет. Активно працюємо зараз, щоб зробити результативним перший глобальний саміт миру у червні. Ми дякуємо усім лідерам та державам, які за цей тиждень висловили свою готовність взяти участь у саміті в Швейцарії. Я хочу окремо подякувати зараз усиллям Олафа, пана канцлера Німеччини, за лідерство та відповідну міжнародну комунікацію, за сигнали, які ми почули з Пекіну. 
Китай дійсно може допомогти відновити справедливий мир для України, стабільність у міжнародних відносинах. Саміт у Швейцарії дає реальний шанс усім нам, щоб статут ООН, його цілі та принципи дійсно запрацювали. Я дякую усім, хто допомагає, дякую кожному і кожній, хто захищає нашу державу, наших людей та, звичайно, однакову для всіх народів справедливість. І хай буде вічною та світлою пам'ять усіх українців, які віддали своє життя заради України. Слава Україні! And the wrong slavo. slavo. And with that, that is the end of the speech from President Volodymyr Zelensky. And at 11.32, goodness gracious, a two-hour and 30-minute long news segment. Probably the longest one we've had since four days ago when the Iranians started uh, bombing the Israelis. But nevertheless, we have to move on into the second segment of the stream. as the part that we enjoy a great deal because we get to talk to all of y'all. And I gotta say that apparently hot dogs are grilling. <laughs> That's because I've seen a lot of people talking about it in the chat. Oh, baby. Uh, and I gotta say, uh, add extra relish, please, and uh, some chili. Um, personally, I like chili dogs. I think they're great. Matthew likes his with relish. But a hot dog's a hot dog, and they all fry the same. Uh, I just hope that that hot dog can uh, get their truck uh, out of the impound lot and also get the right apartment for, for once. I hope that things go right their way one time, and I hope that that right way is downhill from here. And so with that... <laughs> oh, man, life's really... Kicking me in the balls. Oh, oh man. man. I'd love to tell everyone about my utter defeats in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about this time, this girlfriend of mine. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> Do you know why I'm mentally ill? <laughs> That's it. You see, like, bro. my girlfriend. <laughs> That's at least like the Joker or something from that, uh, from the, uh, what, what the hell, Matthew was Heath Ledger Joker. He's like, do you know how I got these scars? <laughs> He's like, do you know how I got these? Do you know how I got this mental illness? Uh, but anyway, so with that, oh my goodness. I can already hear, Matthew, I can already hear the little Discord heating up over there. I mean, the, the servers are warming up. <laughs> That's all they're, they're yeah, warming up. Yeah, those server hotlines ringing. Man, I'm finally going to expose them for what they do. Or some crap like that. It's going to be something like that. I I have the entire world around my finger while he loses another friend or something like that here soon hey. because he's an ass <laughs> or something, you know? Yeah, um, all the people start turning on him and going, going after him big league. I'm like, oh my god, another time, one turned on him. Uh, next time, he's like, I'm winning. The next time, next time there's a Discord call called uh, "Hot Dog Man is an Asshole," I'm gonna be in it. <laughs> I'm gonna be in there. I'll be like, I would know because he's been messing with us for two years. Uh, but anyways, uh, with he's that, always one in that hot dog man. I'm telling you what, he's always one in his mind at least. Man, in his mind, oh goodness. Uh, and even there, that's a tough battle. <laughs> that's a, like even the there. mind is a pitiful thing to waste. And it was sorely wasted there. I mean, it was it was very pitiful, very sore. Uh, wasted. But, Oh man, wasted. Not just wasted. I mean, dude, that was thrown down the drain. <laughs> like it's, it's like mm, terrible stuff. Anyways, after terrible. I get my sip right there, my uh propel watermelon flavored drink, it is time for us to move on. I'm not sponsored by Propel, by the way. I don't know why I had to call that out. But it is time for us to move on into those top questions. And so, Matthew, what do we got? And we have one last poll to address. And we asked everyone, what are your thoughts about Ukraine promising that they will launch a major offensive in 2025 if the West helps them now and allows them to survive through 2024? And 40% said Ukraine will win with 2024 military aid. 36% said aid will give Ukraine a fighting chance. And 12% said Ukraine cannot be helped in time. And I would have to disagree strongly with the 12%. I think with Ukraine getting aid in 2024, that's all they need to survive. At the end of 2024, Russia is going to be hurting for equipment big time. They're also going to have to call up even more people to mobilize. And Ukraine will have a very good chance then of pushing the Russians back. So if we can simply hold out by giving Ukraine aid during this year, Ukraine will have it in the bag, in my opinion. That's pretty clear to me at this point. Um, but the catch is actually getting aid passed to Ukraine because... It's looking a little bit uncertain at the moment. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say that Ukraine would win with 2024 military aid. 
Uh, I don't really see a way that they uh, could win without it. And when I say that, I still think the worst thing that Ukraine could get is a draw. Uh, I don't think they'd ever truly be defeated on the battlefield, uh, at least where the entire country of Ukraine is taken over. Uh, so I would have to say 2024 military aid is incredibly crucial to Ukraine having a, uh, a good chance, a great chance of winning the war. So I hope that there is more that will be coming around the corner. I've heard that apparently... There is some kind of an issue, once again, in the House. Uh, we're trying to move that forward. I'm not getting into the details there because I do not discuss politics and get into that. Hopefully, those will be overcome and the bill will be pushed forward and actually had a vote made on it in the House. Once it passes the House, it'll get rubber stamped in the Senate and Office of the President, and then it'll move on forward into being an actual uh, spending bill that has been passed. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that well, at least the best I can. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and our next one is actually going to be from our Super Chat segment. It was refreshed out of polls once again, so we're moving on to our Super Chats. And first up, we have a $20 donation from Jay Bagwell, the longtime channel hey! legend and friend of the channel. And thank you very much, Jay, for supporting us with that $20 support. He says, a great stream, lads, and you've both been on your A game tonight, and your war analysis is spot on. And thank you very much, Jay. He says, by the way, U.S. Customs are ball breakers and inspect every exported aircraft part to make sure it's legit. They don't play. And they do not play, Jay Bagwell. You are entirely correct on that. Uh, but somehow they still make it out of the freaking country. I'm like, how? Because I remember like reading up on the F-14, and they were like, yeah, they destroyed all of them. Um, so that way there wouldn't be any spare parts for the Iranians. Uh, you know, and the ones that weren't destroyed are in museums and, you know, of course, usually inside or a display aircraft that's had everything stripped out of it and destroyed. So I'm like, how in the world, like, were they getting the parts? I really want to know, uh, like, the actual in-depth details, how they smuggled them. Um, because that would be very interesting to know. But still, thank you so much for enjoying the analysis. And uh, thank you for saying that everything was spot on because that's a very high compliment coming from someone like you, Jay Bagwell. And also, uh, the U.S. Customs is really a ball breaker. I mean, we know because we've been trying to ship the flags out through customs and you have to uh you have to what was it matthew what's it called uh declare uh the items inside yeah, of the wow. poly mailer um like down to a t you have to get it just right or they will reject it outright uh so that that's something that's like dang this is complicated like it really was complicated to fill out the international orders and also the shipping sometimes oh my lord some of y'all live in countries that are apparently like dictatorial regimes on in the post office or something because like they had wild shipping fees. It was crazy. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again for the support, Jay Bagwell, and helping this channel to keep on running because folks like you are amazing people to have here. I thank you so much once again for not only being an old guard and a longtime viewer of this channel, but also an incredible friend of the channel as well and making sure to help this thing keep on running. Support like yours is very important in making this channel possible. And if it wasn't for folks like you who were here, we wouldn't be able to be here tonight running this channel. And so thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. Hello? Little bit of lag, I think. Oh, dang. Uh, but with that, we're on to the next one. And this one is going to go to the Boulder Boy, who puts in a $20 donation. And thank you very much, Boulder Boy, for that support. Hey! He says, Supper Chat seems to work. And all of my subscriptions were gone until I shut down and logged back in. And things were glitchy. And also, by the way, thank you, Boulder Boy, for that support. And everyone, please make sure you're still subscribed to the channel. Because I think some people did get unsubscribed today because of the YouTube glitch. So you might want to take a peek at that. And you may want to take a peek at it. You may. Uh, I would suggest that you do. I, I insist. I insist. But beyond that, I got to thank you so much for the support, Boulder Boy. And thank you once again for helping this channel to keep on running. Super Chat does seem to work a little bit. Um, we have noticed that there is hardly uh, as many Super Chats tonight as there is normally. But, you know, that can be an ebb and flow thing. It could be a YouTube glitch thing that's adding on to it. Uh, and also, sometimes it just is what it is. So we have to, you know, live with it. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I gotta say that that is terrible to hear that all the subscriptions were gone until you logged back in. And I also have to say uh, that YouTube had a very bad glitch because during the first eight minutes of the stream, do y'all know how many people were showing up that were live? 150. I thought that, I thought this stream in the numbers was actually going to do worse than Hot Dog Man stream. Um, and, and then it went up to about, uh, let's see here, 
a nice comfortable 10.5 thousand live viewers so i know that we're not down at the hot dog man's level um why don't you mention my name because you'll never be recognized you bastard but anyways beyond that um, <laughs> say my name say it dude that man thinks he's walter white over there say my name it's like no like Forget it, dude. You're not getting a free shout out. No, go burn in hell. Something like that. But beyond that, um, I got to say, thank you so much for once again for support, Boulder Boy, and helping this thing to keep on running. And things were fairly glitchy at the beginning, but luckily it looks like most things have sorted out by this point. But still, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right. And our next one is going to go to John Person, who puts in a $20 donation. Hey! Thank you, George John, for your support. He says, guys, thanks for the hard work and keeping up with the fast moving news. And it certainly is moving fast today, John. He says, your knowledge of history and military hardware really adds a lot of value to news reports and LSA. Hey, and thank you so much for appreciating that. That's something that I built up over years. I mean, I don't even think I really read books on it. I just ended up looking at enough vehicles over enough time to really get, uh, really get it down with the identification of uh, of equipment and hardware. And usually, that it doesn't extend into the electronic warfare category and all that, which I really need to get brushed up on and really know well, uh, because electronic warfare is such an important part of the battlefield these days. Uh, but with that. Uh, uh, I have to say, thank you so much for really enjoying how we've been trying to keep up to date with all this news. It is a lot to track, because now, instead of keeping my eyes directly on Ukraine and everything going on in that conflict, I'm having to do that same thing with the Middle East at the same time now, on two entirely separate maps, as best as I possibly can. Uh, and it actually is a lot of work. It doubles my workload trying to do both new segments each night. Uh, but I'm more than happy to do it because I love to know that we are able to get the news out to all of y'all and share it with y'all uh, and, and really get to hear that y'all enjoy it and like it a lot. Just hearing that y'all really enjoy the news is, is so much uh, motivation for us to be able to do this and just keep this going. Uh, and so I got to thank you so much once again, uh, greatly, John Person, for enjoying this and really appreciating the way that this news is run and covered. And so thank you so much once again. And long live the LSA. The LSA will never die. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one is going to go to Panama Floyd, another longtime legend who puts in a 20 and says, eh, hey! some for flow, some, wait a minute, some flow for the ebb and one from the chat, please. And thank you so much for the support, Panama Floyd. Two chairs, two chairs. And thank you so much for the ebb and flow. That's something that uh, is always uh, interesting about running live streams uh, that don't have ads or sponsors is just run straight off support is that we don't have the kind of certainty that other YouTubers have when they have ads and sponsors because they know that there will be a set amount of income they make on a given night. But that's something we take. I mean, you know, we have we have great nights. We have low nights. I mean, it is what it is. I, I'm still, it doesn't really matter much to me. I'm just happy to be on here running this news and getting to talk to all of y'all. The support helps us to keep it running, but it isn't the first thing on my mind. It really, the first thing on my mind is making the news as good as we can make it. And I feel like tonight we really went above and beyond because it was a two and a half hour long news segment. I was like, we can't make it any better than this because it was literally news, news, and nothing but news. Uh, but still... Thank you so much once again for the support and helping this channel to keep on running Panama Floyd for the ebb and the flow. And we will make sure to take one from the live chat. And so what do we got, Matthew? And this one from the live chat goes to Mark Gagne, who says, will the UK lend Israel their Dragonfire 6? Um, most likely not. Because the Israelis already have the Iron Beam. It seems as though the British want to give that system to the Ukrainians first, uh, so that way they can use the uh, the radar, well, actually the laser system, to more effectively defend their airspace, which I feel is a very prudent call by the British. It seems as though they are trying to prioritize uh, the equipment f to the countries that need it the most. And so with that, I hope that does address that well, and I thank you so much once again uh, for sponsoring that live chat, uh, Panama Floyd, and helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to AMX-10 Speedy Bang Bang, who puts in a 10, and says, if Iran needs Russia for nuclear development defense, then it doesn't seem very smart by Iran and Russia to time this while Russia is busy in another war. You know, I would agree, um, but... I think the Russians and the Iranians are really just lacking that much brain power that this seems like a good idea to them. Um, I don't know why the Russians would join in on the side of Iran, because if I remember correctly, uh, Iran was funding and supporting terrorist groups that have ended up attacking Russia in the past, historically. So that is a little weird to me that they would want to help them. 
Um, but hey, you know, it, it is what it is, I suppose. I'm sure that if those terrorist groups uh, were ever brought up to Putin, you know, nowadays, and they were like, well, what about these groups? Putin would go, those were simply funded by Soviet Vavod Vases of Vest or some shit like that. You know, like you would say something goofy like that. That would really just make me pissed off. Um, because then people would believe him because they go, hey, American politicians aren't truthful, but at least you know Putin is. It's like, are you stupid? It's like, he's more untruthful than the American politicians. He literally lies for a living. And if you don't agree with his lies, he kills you. It's like, this guy is a true, like, this guy is truly one of the worst. It's like, you can't get around that. Uh, but still, with that, I hope that does address that well. Thank you so much once again for support. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and our next one goes to another channel legend, Duncan VR. But real quick, I got to get rid of this guy called Alan because he just came in here and absolutely uh, tried to uh, take Ukraine down with his, uh, with his <laughs> statement. They're not good. Bad fella, get out of here, Alan. Bye-bye. But anyways, this one goes to Duncan. And thank you very much, Duncan, for that $15 support. And he puts in the random animal noises once again. He puts a lot hey! of them in. He says, Bamua, Baba, Moo Quack. Hot Dog Man went to the poo-poo camp. Uh, oh, no. and, <laughs> <laughs> and the marmot is at poo-poo camp. Oink, oink. Ellen the marmot. Seen a nice... Oh, whoa, what the hell? <laughs> what the hell? This took a left turn. Can't oh, say my that. lord! But, oh, my god! <laughs> Duncan, thank you very much for the support. And also the wild super chat tonight. But Enforcer, what say you? Oh, my... I think I just got, like, shocked reading that last part. Oh, my lord. Duncan... Thank you for being a channel legend and always throwing in the animal noises. That last part, if it was read on air, I think we'd get banned off YouTube. <laughs> like it's, 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 it's like, oh my God. But still, thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running, Duncan, because if it wasn't for folks like you, we wouldn't be able to be absolutely blown away right now. But still, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that uh, fairly well. And also, um, I, I think I think Hot Dog Man is at Sapupu Camp. Uh, because Matthew, if I'm remembering correctly, he was given the wrong apartment. Something like that. He was so something mixed up with the apartment or something like that. And then, uh, he felt like he was getting screwed over and then his truck got towed the same day. <laughs> and it's like, it couldn't got any worse. Oh man. And on top of that day going terribly, my life is not. Oh, yeah. Don't forget the date. <laughs> Don't forget the date. Oh my God, man. Out of everything, the date thing was the most cringy. I oh, couldn't really God. handle to listen to that. Well, you he know, had no clue how he sounded. He sounded crazy as hell saying it. Well, you know what I think is really cringe is making a video touring your brand new apartment. Like, I think that's kind of cringe. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, the whole thing is cringe. Man, the guy's cringe. Like, he just, like, oh, my God. It's oh. really, I'm shocked. Like, there's people that listen to him. Like, seriously shocked. Like, uh, you know, I'm not an advocate for, you know, telling people to do things. But uh, I wouldn't recommend listening to that guy. That's for certain. No. Hot Dog Man's a no-go. Uh, also, another thing, another stupid thing, like, you know, because, because someone brought it out to me and I saw it, is that apparently a post was made and, the, and, and Hot Dog Man was like, why won't you show my name? It's like you know why like you you must be stupid not to know why i'm not giving you a plug you're not getting any you're not getting any publicity of your stupid actions and your small riddled crack mind brain trying to r riddle up drama i don't give a crap like we we don't like you and i'll make that very clear uh but i'm not going to give you a he single he thinks he's smarter than everybody yeah. else that's for sure it's yeah. crazy it's that narcissism man like he thinks he's brilliant or something but he doesn't realize that everybody sees his like uh, con from like a mile away well, well you know what you know what he you know what kind of mindset he has he has has the same kind of mindset as people who get in like those panels uh or whatever you know that that go on every once in a while and then all, all the panel is is people going oh yes you're so genius and smart but i'm a genius and smart man as well and then they all go hmm yes and genius and smart it's like listen if i wanted people to stroke my ego like i i, I would just you know i, I wouldn't do that i mean <laughs> that, that looks bad like i was like that looks cringe uh but you know, I was like, geez, uh, it, it's a it's a tough world out there. It's a tough world. Uh, and, and that guy's living the toughest one. He's like, he's like, why do I keep getting the toughest battles? It's like, because you're an asshole. And everyone in the world knows it, even the people leasing an apartment to you. Uh, but anyways, with that, hope that does address that well. Oh, my Lord. I just looked at the live chat. I was like, oh, my God, dude, the roasts. The roasts are bad. <laughs> like They're terrible. Uh, oh, my God. Anyways. With that, we're on to the next. <laughs> oh, like, dude, do you see the live chat right now? Yeah, I'm seeing it, man. Oh, I'm my God, it. dude. This uh, this is like R-rated up in there. Jeez. Uh, but anyways, we're on to the next one. 
And our next one is going to go to Blue Flam Triple Seven LSA, who puts in a twenty dollar donation and hey! says, "Love you, Green LSA." And question to the chat. And LSA, baby! And I got to thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. Blue Flam Triple Seven. And I also got to say, "Love you, Green." In the end, we will send the question to the chat. And so, Matthew, what do we got? And the question to the chat this time is going to go to Casper, who says, do you think Russia will actually attack Israel, or is it just political games? I'm not really sure. Uh, I feel like the Russians really are stupid enough to do something like that. But at the same time, I feel like they're so distracted in Ukraine, it would probably be hard for them to divert any real efforts into uh, Israel, or towards Israel for that matter. Uh, and so... With that, I hope that does address that fairly well, at least in my opinion, because I could go into a really deep analysis as to why, which I did very early on in the stream. But I have a feeling that uh, Russian involvement, uh, direct involvement, would probably be minor, or it would be non-existent. They, and this is nothing more than a diplomatic move to try and uh, force the Israelis into not responding to Iran in fear of Russian retaliation, which I don't think they should be that scared of, going off of what the Russians have done in Ukraine. Um, but with that, once again... Thank you so much once, uh, for sponsoring that live chat, Blue Flame Triple Seven, and thank you for helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to Andy L, who puts in a ten dollar donation. And thank you very much, Andy, for that support. He says, "I am not sure Russia can support another full conventional war." What say you? And no, hell no, they cannot. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. They, their military has been wrecked uh, from this war. It would take a while to rebuild it up to a size where it could even conduct another war like this one, which is an abysmal failure. Uh, so I would have to say no. I don't think so. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well, at least in my opinion. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to the Badger Bro, who puts in a $10 donation and says, Enforcer, uh, Russia can't even protect their oil fields, and I doubt Russia will bleed for Iran. And should USA give Iran the same treatment given to Saddam Hussein in Iraq with WMD? I would say yes, for the most part, I think we should. But I always I always have to go into a really deep rabbit hole, but I'm going to make it a little bit quicker tonight so that way I don't go through like the whole 20-minute, 30-minute rabbit hole. We can't nation build like we used to do back in the early 2000s where we go and invade a country with a completely different culture and a completely different ideology that can't even really like it can't like like Middle Eastern countries simply cannot wrap their minds around Western forms of government. It's just something they culturally can't do, much like we can't wrap our minds around a Middle Eastern form of government. It's a very hard thing for the Western mind to comprehend how Middle Eastern governments work because of their cultures that have existed for thousands of years, much like the cultures, cultures that existed here in the West for thousands of years. So to try and nation build off of something that is completely alien and foreign to these people for their government to work off of forever beyond that point is completely infeasible. If we did something like that, in Iran, I feel like we would have to make sure that we have as minimal involvement as possible in setting up uh, an interim government and then letting them create a new national permanent government. As long as that government ends up not being anti-American, even if they are neutral um, or just a little indifferent to America, that's fine. As long as they're not straight up unfriendly to the United States, that's all the requirement that we're looking for. Uh, and then they could figure out whatever they want for their government, you know, and it's up to the people. So if it ends up being a little repressive, then we got to let that go because that's what the culture apparently wants in the region, the majority of it. Uh, or if it ends up being uh, an incredibly uh, free country where you could really do whatever you want, um, that's its own thing too. That's up to them. We shouldn't really get a lot involved in trying to morph the country into what we would want it to be off of an American image. It ought to become whatever it will become um, with minimal involvement if we went to that level but i would say in my honest opinion yes but we would have to do what the after effects of that we would have to make sure to carefully manage like i'm talking about uh but still with that i hope that does uh, address that further well thank you so much once again for support badger bro and helping this channel to keep on running and with that we are on to the next one all right and the next one goes to gunfox 61 who puts in a 10 and says wait until asia kicks off and you have not one, not two, but three, four, or five theaters of war to cover, and a bunch of smaller wars in South America, Africa, and the major ones in Asia, Middle East, and Europe. And I thank you so much for the support, and what you were describing right there 
is gun fox 61 is literally world war ii because you had a theater in northern africa you had a theater in the middle east a little bit uh because of the iranian intervention in uh well actually the intervention in persia i believe in 1942 i think it was uh that that happened uh and then you also have the conflicts inside of southeast asia you had the conflicts inside of china itself uh, in northern Russia, well, actually, in in the far east of Russia, down in the Pacific Islands. I mean, you have multiple different, um, I guess you could say, campaigns that were going on, but then they were split into two theaters. The European theater, which included North Africa and the Middle East, and then you had the Pacific theater, which included everything else in the world that wasn't a part of the European theater. Uh, so it would actually be World War II at that point all over again, with all of the conflicts happening in different areas of the world. Which, when you really think about it, that is a that is a logistical feat uh, that the Allies were able to fight over so many different fronts uh, for the course of, really, uh, if you want to call the Marco Polo Bridge incident at the beginning of war, from 1936 to 1945, almost nine years. But if you really want to count the European War as the start from 1939 to 1945, that is that was actually that's actually wild to think about because it was the kind of logistical structure we have in the world today, but. 70 to 80 years ago with the technology of 70 to 80 years ago that was truly a feat because nowadays it actually be quick uh quick and easy work to conduct a war around the world especially for the united states but for back then you really had to build up a lot of that infrastructure especially for the united states from the ground up because we weren't this uh preeminent power uh like we are today around the world uh but with that i hope that does address that fairly well and thank you so much once again for the support gun fox 61 and helping this channel to keep on running because you are absolutely correct there could be a lot of fronts in an upcoming world war like that much like there was in world war ii but with that we are on to the next one in our next one is going to go to John Bartley, who puts in a 10 and says, Hey guys, I'm curious of the route that jet fighters will take to hit Iran, and I heard that the Jordanians will not open their airspace to Israel for a counterattack. If the Israelis were to conduct an airstrike mm -hmm, against Iran, they most likely... Hmm, that's actually a good question. That, that would actually pose a bit of an obstacle because if the Saudis and the Jordanians are not that big of a fan of letting Israeli aircraft fly over and the Syrians and the Lebanese have somewhat hostile airspace against the Israelis, there isn't really a way for them to strike back at Iran all too well. Or they could just disregard the Jordanians because the Jordanians most likely would not fire on and shoot down um, Israeli aircraft. They could just fly straight over Jordan on into Iraq and then start shooting at the Iranians that way. Uh, because I don't think they would fly their aircraft all the way down the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and up into the Gulf of Oman to fire. That would be a really long air route, probably require a decent amount of aerial tankers. And I'm not really sure. Let me check uh, the Israeli Air Force and see if they have... Uh, aerial tankers. Let me see if they have a large amount of them because I know they have a good amount of tankers. Uh, it's just not a lot of them. Um, at least that's what I'm thinking, but let me make sure to check. Let's see here. Tankers. So they have seven Boeing 707s that are aerial refuelers. They have uh, a K46, uh, KC-46 Pegasus, eight of those on order. And then they have seven KC-130 Hercules that are also aerial tankers as well. So in total right now, they have 14 aerial tankers. So if they wanted to conduct a long-range air operation, they could probably have uh, three of them or four of these aerial refuelers airborne at a single time at certain waypoints through the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Gulf of Oman, and they could conduct an airstrike against Iran, but it would be logistically a much more complicated operation to pull off at that point, and not only that, it also would be a lot more expensive as well, considering the amount of air crews that are airborne, the amount of aircraft that are flying, and the cost per hour that it takes to keep aerial uh, tankers in the skies. But they, they really wanted to conduct to strike against the random that was the only way they could do it that's probably the way they would pull it off and so with that i hope that does address that well thank you so much once again for the support and with that we are on to the next one in our next big shout out to robert johnson who put in a five dollar donation along with old buzzard who put in a five hey! and said coffee and also we had a five from metal seer and thank you very much to metal old buzzard and robert very much for that support and we appreciate it very much and enforcer what say you and i gotta thank the three of y'all so much for the support uh and helping this channel to keep on running because if it wasn't for folks like y'all we wouldn't be able to be here right now i and i gotta thank y'all for that and i gotta thank you old buzzard oh yeah old buzzard for throwing in your 20th super chat ever massive shout out to you and thank y'all so much to the three of y'all once again um but with that I hope that does address that well, and we are on to the next one. 
And the next one goes to Paul B, who puts in a five and says, I've been here since a week, uh, since week two. Hey. And I thought I finally had the honor of being the first one to like a stream. Even if YouTube is having issues, it's a win for me. Hey, and thank you so much for the support, Paul B. And that is pretty cool to think about it. Uh, a lot of people got a chance at getting to be the first one to hit the like button tonight. Uh, and I got to tell you, all I was actually thinking for a second because I didn't know YouTube was having a problem until Matthew told me. I saw for like three minutes there was only like 120 people on. And usually by the third the third minute mark these days, we're up to like 800 or 900 live viewers. Uh, and so I was like, dang, I think like no one's getting on tonight. And then Matthew's like, oh, no, it's a glitch. Uh, hopefully it'll sort itself out or we're really going to be screwed. Uh, and then around like the eight minute mark, it finally started counting viewers. And then we got all the way up to 10.5 thousand. So I feel like that was a fairly normal number, but the thing is, is that the amount of views that we've gotten indicates that it was an even higher viewership than what YouTube's even telling us it was at the peak, because we've gotten 123,000 views so far in three hours. That's unheard of on a 12,000 live viewer stream even that we had a couple of nights ago. Uh, it got up to 125,000 after being up for about three days. Uh, so... Going off of that, I'm kind of feeling like the viewership was even higher, maybe even towards 14,000 live viewers or close to 15,000 live viewers tonight, but YouTube isn't reporting that number. So sadly, we didn't get to see how many of y'all really were here tonight. We just kind of got a rough approximation. But beyond that, I got to say, thank you so much for being here tonight. YouTube was having a glitch, but nevertheless, the least, uh, YouTube broke before the Least Spring Army did, and the Least Spring Army continued to keep going the way it always has. And so with that, Thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Nick LSA, who puts uh -huh. in a $5 donation and says, Hello, Matt and Andrew. And hello, Nick. Hello. He said, Carrie Ann and I appreciate all your hard work and dedication and marmot. Oh, you know it. Oh, you know it. It's that time. But before we get to that, I do thank you so much for appreciating all of our uh, hard work and dedication to this. And I saw someone just a second ago in the live chat. Sadly, I forget names because there's a lot going on and uh, the names just go right in my head and right back out when I read them in the live chat. But I do see everyone's messages. Uh, and someone said, wow, I just got back. Good job keeping it going strong for over two years. I know. Like, it's, it's actually a feat um, because so many people have either uh, petered out in two years and have given up. Uh, or they they've been they've been removed through one form or another. Uh, like I've been hearing some drama today about a YouTube channel that's possibly getting deleted, uh, and they said that it was Russian bots. And I don't know a lot about the situation, uh, but one thing I will say share this info because you know we make sure i make sure to read the youtube policies and rules for the creators like myself and follow them to a t so that way we don't end up getting in trouble with youtube uh and one thing that i i know that i read uh was that you cannot create a duplicate channel and upload identical content onto a duplicate channel under any circumstances uh and i saw the i saw the video today that they made uh, and it sounds as though they had multiple duplicate channels that were uploading, I think, I don't know for sure because I, you know, I didn't ever see any of the duplicate channels, but from what I've heard, they uploaded the exact same content. The only difference was is that the subtitles were perfected to be in a different foreign language. Uh, and what that does on YouTube's end to explain uh, a termination from YouTube's end on that, uh, not to speak it like a representative of YouTube, but this is what I understand, Creating a duplicate channel, uploading the same stuff we would on this channel. So let's say the video I made today earlier, the short war video, I made Enforcer 2.0 and I uploaded that same one onto that channel and turned the AdSense on there. I'm technically double dipping um, AdSense and that's a violation of YouTube policies because you can only upload one video, uh, one unique video one time. If you upload it again as a duplicate, uh, that is considered an abuse of the YouTube monetization system, uh, and that can lead to an immediate termination if YouTube finds out. I think that's what largely happened uh, from what I could see. Uh, because, and of course, I don't know for sure, uh, but that's something that YouTube may have investigated on their own because for that to happen to every single channel and for every single channel to be deleted, uh, that is uh, a little wild. Uh, so, you know, I would, that that's what I saw. Uh, I'm not saying that that's exactly what happened, but, you know, that's what I was looking at. And if it's something like that, uh, usually YouTube has to act because you're really, you know, double dipping. Ad, ad, ad sponsors don't want to have a whole bunch of their ads put on the same videos. Uh, and also on top of that, um, YouTube doesn't want people making more off of a video than they should by uploading it multiple times in different places on YouTube. Uh, so... 
I hope that kind of addresses it from what I know. Uh, I don't really know how it is for certain, but uh, if that was the case, that's a little unfortunate, but that would be a violation of YouTube's rules. Uh, and if it's not the case, then that's very bad to hear that they're being deleted, and hopefully people can turn that around at some point. Um, but with that, I hope that, but beyond that, it is crazy that we've been able to keep this going for two years because, like I was saying, other people are either getting removed from the platform or they're petering out and they're just kind of giving up or they're falling to the wayside, one or the other. Um, and so I hope that does address that fairly well, at least in my opinion. Uh, and thank you so much once again for the support, Nick, and helping this channel to keep on rolling. And with that, Matty, did uh, Nick want a live chat? Let's see. I don't think so. Uh, let me double check, though. Uh, let's we'll see here. Uh... No, I don't think so. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. And the next one is going to go to Richard Hawkins, who puts in a $50 donation. Massive support. And thank you very much, Richard, hey! for supporting the channel. It says, which conflict ends first, Russia versus Ukraine or Israel versus Iran? And definitely the second one for sure, because the Russia-Ukraine one's going to take a long time. Israel-Iran might be over a little bit quicker than that, I have a feeling. But Enforcer, what do you think? I would have to say, first off, thank you so much for the massive support and helping this channel to keep on running. And I would have to say, if a conflict was to end first, it would most likely be the Israel versus Iran one. I, th I feel like it would. Either it's going to flame up into being a world war or a major regional conflict, uh, but it will not last that long, at least in my opinion. Uh, because both sides don't really have a way to drag on a long, long and drawn out ground conflict. Uh, and so... That, that would be my answer. And so with that, I thank you so much once again for the massive support. And I also saw someone there, uh, let's see, I, I saw someone say the name of the channel. And they also explained what it was. They said they uploaded the videos with different languages. Uh, they did it in different languages. Yeah, that is, I'll, I'll explain this quickly because now that we have that clarification, that is a, a violation of YouTube's policies uh, on how monetization works. Because if you want to do your video in different languages, you don't go and make 20 separate channels and then uh, upload the same video with dubs in 20 different languages. You do what the president of Ukraine's website does on YouTube, which I'll show y'all because y'all see us complaining about it every night. Um, and let me go over here and grab the speech. And I'll show y'all because when we click on it, and you want to hear this video from the president of, of Ukraine's website in a different language. Dear Ukraine. You go down here and you pick the audio track. So that's what you do. You don't go and make 20 different channels and make one channel that has it in Chinese and one that makes it in Polish. Because that is a violation of, of the monetization on YouTube. You're trying to get maybe like 20 times the income off of a single video from AdSense. That That's what the issue uh, was right there because if you wanted to have many different languages you just add the dubs in onto the first video that you uploaded on your main channel you don't go make 20 different ones with 20 different audio tracks because technically that's a violation of the system uh, so I don't know if that was, I don't know if that was Russian bots or more so YouTube conducting an audit um, but that's unfortunate to hear but anyways uh, with that I hope that does address that fairly well and with that we are on to the next one all right, and the next one is going to go to... Also, by the way, before we move on to our next one, uh, Nick said that they were looking for the Marmot. Oh, yeah. Oh, dang, I forgot. Hey, it's the Marmot. Oh, hello there. Uh, hello there. How you doing? Hello. Would you like a problem, Governor? Or better yet, would you like an eviction? <laughs> an eviction? Oh, dear me. You're telling me I can get kicked out my flat? You can get kicked out your flat, Governor, just like that. Oh man, but I just gave a tour of it. Too bad, Governor. Pack your shit and go. <laughs> they, they said, "Oh man, I paid for that Gucci apartment. You know that with that money that I'm getting from the viewers that should be donating to Ukraine, and I'm going and getting a Gucci apartment. Uh, well, where's my apartment, good sir? It's a straight up freaking grift. <laughs> it's a straight up grift. He's pulling that Tokyo grift, and I'm more than happy to film it and show it to everyone because I don't make a damn dime. But look at me upgrading my apartment." apartment so it's like where'd the money come from it's like where did that Man, come he's from? like he's like the uh you know that one mega church preacher whoever the guy's name is i forgot whose name it was what's his name um uh oh, damn i got his, 20 chandeliers 20 chandeliers no no not him it's um kenneth copeland he's oh. like i hope I, I hope you i hope you like this jet that i bought this 50 million dollar jet because you bought it <laughs> that really is 
Oh, man. Dude, there's going to be another hit. Wait, sir. Wait, sir. Another hit piece, please. Another Serve hit up the piece. hit piece. Serve yes. it up hot. I want it. I want it hot and toasty. I want it on. I want it on my feed tomorrow. <laughs> it's a normal stream say time. Say my name. Say my name. Say my. Like that's one thing we never have to worry about on that channel is that our name <laughs> will be said. Like we don't even have to say it. I just know it will be said. Uh, and, and I love it because every once in a while we get a viewer in here who's like, hey, I just came from that place. That guy sucks. And I'm like, hey, thanks. If the guy never said our name, you wouldn't even know who we are. Uh, but anyways, with that. Um, I hope that does address that well, Nick. So sorry, I forgot about the marmot. And that was like the first thing I said about your super chat too. Uh, but with that, now that we've addressed that well, and I hope that everyone enjoyed the appearance of the marmot, it's time for us to move on to the next one. And the next one goes to Seth, who puts in a $10 donation and says, does Israel still have military personnel on the Dalak Archipelago, Eritrea? Uh, I don't know if they do. Uh, I would have to check into that a little bit, uh, because at the moment I'd have to declare ignorance. So, sadly, I don't know for now, but they may or they may not. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But I do thank you for the support and helping this channel to keep on running, because folks like you do help to make it possible. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Yassi Rodin, who puts in a five, and says Russia is worried about Israel striking Iran's drone factories. Uh, maybe so. That may actually be what they're concerned about. But then they're getting, they're going to get too involved with the Israelis like they did with Ukraine to try and fix a small-term situation that would have a minimal impact on resources. They're going to expend a massive amount of resources and a massive amount of manpower trying to deal with the situation, which makes no sense at all. But that's how the Russians run. Um, like, that's just how the Russians work, uh, which just makes no sense at all. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And thank you so much once again for support, because that sounds like a very astute observation to me. Uh, and with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Barry Badrinov, who puts in a five and says, I believe that Russian propaganda has been working too well, and they are splitting both sides from America, and we need to PSA from LSA to the world that. And I thank you for the support, Barry Badrinov. And I'd actually have to say... Uh, a lot of people don't see this, but there's a lot of foreign subversion happening in the United States from the Russians and the Chinese at the same time. The Chinese like to kind of, fan like, like both sides pick, uh, a, pick a group that they like, uh, and they instigate them or they agitate them. Uh, the Chinese pick one side. I'm not going to say which sides. I'm sure many of y'all know, like, the running statements that are out there, so y'all know what I'm saying when I say it. But the Chinese really love to to agitate one side into getting in action and getting really enraged at the other. And then the Russians like to pick the opposite side. I don't think that's something that they planned out. I just think that the Chinese went, oh, look, these people kind of lean a little bit more our way, so we'll just agitate them on whatever and, st and start causing unrest in America on that end. And then the Russians looked at the other side and they went, hey, our public image kind of looks a little bit like this in America, so if we really agitate that side, they'll get really pissed off and really angry and violent. Uh, and so both of them uh, continue to do that in an attempt to try and really just really enrage both sides and get them violent. Because you'll notice, and I hope that people do notice this, if you ever look a little bit deeper into any of the uh, any of like the political organizations that have sprung up in recent years around one side or the other, you'll usually see that the money eventually gets traced back to either the Russian Federation or the Chinese Communist Party, uh, depending on which side they're on. Most of them do. Uh, very few of them are actually grassroots. Most of them actually get funding or at least some kind of support from the Russians or the Chinese Communist Party, one or the other. Uh, and it's always interesting to see that because people don't pay attention to that. Like one time we were on this like uh, this uh, this uh, Mario and Luigi Narwhal show or whatever the hell it was called, and like we were sitting there, we never got to talk, which was a waste of time to even be there. Uh, but we were sitting there waiting to talk, which chance never came, and we were listening to this guy, and he was like. You know, in China, they observe the citizens, uh, and and they uh, and they watch them with the secret police. And if they say anything wrong, they get them. And we need something like that in America to stop the so and sos and the so and sos. And I was like, man, this guy sounds like a commie. You know, like we clicked on his profile <laughs> picture, and, and and like his whole Twitter profile popped up, and the guy was literally a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Like it was like it wasn't even like a stretch. He literally said in his Twitter profile. Chinese Communist Party member. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And this guy is telling people in America how things should run. 
and people are listening to this. And then you had, uh, yeah. then you had Narwhal. That was a crazy thing that people were listening to that guy like he was legitimate. And, and there are some people in there going, uh huh. It's like, what are you crazy? It's like you're sitting here talking about protecting the West, and you're listening to a communist, and you're like nodding to it. Yeah, and then and then you had Narwhal out there in the shitter going, yeah, yeah, that's valid, that's valid. On oh, God, we need to execute the political dissidents. Yeah, I was like, what the hell? I was like. What is this? And then and then we were supposed to be on the Ukraine war segment. We kept asking people, when's the Ukraine war segment? It's coming. It's like, we got a show to run. We can't be here all night. When's that coming up? Sorry, they pushed it back to be another hour from now. It's like, listen, I don't sit around doing nothing. We got a whole news channel we're running here. I'm, I'm not sitting around listening to this dumb shit all night. This is a waste of my time. So then we left and then it found, and then uh, someone ended up getting investigated because they weren't paying Uncle Sam. Uh, and so I was like, interesting, very, very interesting. But anyways, <laughs> with that, I hope that does address that. Well, remember folks, did you file your taxes? I know I did. <laughs> I know I did. Did you file your taxes? Make sure to do that because the government doesn't like it when you don't. Um, but with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. Thank you so much for once again for support. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Point of Guinness, who puts in the five and says, you've been tangoed by two group, two group, two group. Please take one from the chat. And we will take one from the chat. But, of course, two group, two group. Uh, but with that, Mandy, what do we got in the chat? And this one goes to O-Tubes, who says, I wasn't Putin friends with Israel at the beginning of Ukraine war because Israel didn't show support to Ukraine. Uh, the Russians, uh, it's a little weird with the Russians. But it's actually a third of the of the Jewish population inside of Israel. It actually has Russian descent. Uh, so there's actually a large Russian presence inside of Israel just from the ethnic background. Um, and so they, they try and like stay on like neutral terms with them. But in the end, the Russians hate Israel because they're a Western aligned country. And if there's anything that can be done against them, they're going to side with whoever's going against them for that reason. That's why we saw that Wagner was entertaining the idea of giving a pants here to Hezbollah for a little bit because it was it was an anti-Western thing. It doesn't matter if they if the Russians ideologically agree with them. It just matters if they're going to end up fighting the West. Uh, because and, and that's what people don't get. That's why things get so complicated looking when you really look deep in the weeds on anything going on around the world. Is that the United States and will end up supporting Israel, and the Russians will end up supporting Iran. Uh, and in reality. Israel isn't really that similar to the United States in some ways. It's actually very different. And Iran is completely different than the Russian Federation. While they're both dictatorships, completely different culturally and ideologically. But you'll end up seeing um, both sides supporting one or the other because they're both aligned towards each other's overall interests either Russian interests or Western interests. And so that's why we end up supporting them. It's not because it's not because we believe like some people want to think America believes it's not because we believe that, uh, Israel is the Jewish Holy land, you know, or, or because, you know, some people believe that or not in government, but that's not the actual moving factor. The motivator behind us actually is supporting the Israelis. It's the fact that they're Western aligned. That's why we support them. Um, and, and, you know, people don't get that. People think, that because the United States supports Israel or, you know, or is hostile against Iran, then the United States hates Islam and loves Judaism. It's, it has nothing to do with that. That's not even the level that the United States is on. It's a strategic thing in the region. It has nothing to do with religious ideology or cultural ideology or anything like that. It's, it's, it's a completely separate thing. And I don't, I don't like when people try and tie that down into like an ideological thing where the U.S. government is picking a side like that because they're not. And if you ever look at their actions in the region, they're not because we're also friends with the Saudis. We're also friends with the Jordanians. So it throws in a whole wrench into this, into that whole idea that a lot of people try and push out because we're friends with Islam, with majority Islamic nations in the region. And we're also friends with, uh, with the Jewish nation in the region as well in Israel. And we have an absolutely no care at all about the cultural ideologies. We just care about Western aligned countries and the resources they have. And also uh, the strategic implication of having them as an ally economically. Those are the only things we care about. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that well. And thank you so much once again for, uh, for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one goes to a Blue Flam 777 LSA who puts in a five and says, what's the difference between an internet troll and a video game character? He said, video game characters have lives. LSA question oh. the chat. Oh, my God. Burn. <laughs> oh, that is a burn. Oh, my goodness. Man, put some put some ice on that, or better yet, uh, get get some money for that impound ticket. Aww. 
man. Oh, man. Oh. Dude, you know what we do at this point with our voice? We almost sound like those little wooden toads that they used to have in the classes in middle school where you take like that that like wooden stick and you'd like rub it across the top and it'd go, you know what I'm talking about? Ribbit. Yeah, Ribbit. yeah, we almost do that. Man. <laughs> oh, man. What a roast. Oh, man. Let me play my detective music while I investigate Romania. Ew, Ribbit. yuck. Ribbit. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That. Thank you so much once again for the support to help this channel to keep on running Blue Flame Triple Seven. And that was a good dad joke. I loved it. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Jared Draper, who puts in a five and says, The Junkoy Air Base in Crimea just got hit hard and hit hard. And I thank you so much for the support. And I actually saw when you threw that in, it was 30 minutes after we actually covered it. So I don't think you were here for it. Uh, but we did cover that attack while it happened live on air. Do you want to be a part of the chocolate club? What the hell is an actual right. club? The club. Look at that club. Man, what they got rooms for in the club like this? Dude, why in the world do they have like Chernobyl radiation on the camera? <laughs> yeah, really man and they got like hotel rooms in this club it's kind of a different club man i think this is that kind of club where you get brides by the hour or something in here i don't think this is whoa. that kind of good club you know what i mean goodness whoa jack oh look at him whoa jack you got this <laughs> whoa. little yeah this little guy here it looks like he's about to say crazy. but oh my god whoa <laughs> let's see here yeah, you know what? I think this oh, is that kind oh, of club. Oh, look at that now. I think this is that kind of a club. <laughs> he said, hello there. <laughs> you <laughs> he you said, coming with me. He said, hello there. Would you like to see my, uh, my radio mask? <laughs> it's like, mm, I don't know about <laughs> that. I, I disagree. <laughs> but anyways, oh, man. That, that woman was like uh, six foot five. We're going to play basketball, <laughs> Jack. Whoa, put him in the WNBA. Whoa, Jack, that woman was tall. She can sit there and crush you. <laughs> she can really crush you right there. Really do some damage. Whoa, I need an ice cream on my desk now, and I need that I need that uh, that tall woman right there fighting on the front. <laughs> Anyways, with that, I hope that does uh, address that fairly well. Um, but but with that, thank you so much for the support. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one is going to go to Tom Charles, who puts in a five. And it says, thanks y'all for the amazing job y'all do, and question to the chat, please. Hey, and thank you so much for enjoying the amazing job we do, and we will make sure to send a question to the chat. And so with that, Matthew, what do we got? And this one is going to go to G uh, GHJ, who says, if Russia participates in an attack against Israel, uh, does that mean that Israel can attack Russian shipping in the Mediterranean? I think it technically would mean yes, because that means that the Russians are getting involved in a war against Israel. And I and I've seen I've seen some stupid arguments um, on the internet, the stupidest ones. Uh, and and I actually saw one because I don't say this much, but I do have my own personal Instagram account, and I follow someone uh, from high school uh, on there. And I was just going through the stories today uh, that people had posted, and I saw them putting out this whole thing. It was like an anti-Israel thing. And it was like, the Israelis were in the wrong. Everyone knows that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is an innocent group of people supporting Islamic interests in the Middle East. They have never done anything violent. And the Israelis striking them was wrong. And I was like, what the hell? Wait, somebody from the high school said that? Yeah, someone from, you wouldn't know them. I knew them, though, because they were in my grade. But someone in from our high school put that up on their story today. And I was like, what the hell? What kind of world are you living in? And then they said... Hitting a consulate is just wrong. Simply wrong. And it's like, well, they're harboring terrorists inside of their embassy. I feel like it's a little bit different. You know, like, it's it's like you can't use diplomatic immunity and the diplomatic protection of an embassy to harbor terrorists. You know, like, it's like, that's that seems to be crossing a little line that's, there. That's that Alabama education coming across. They weren't very big in the world politics oh. thing in high school oh, in the Alabama education. Dude, and it was worse because then they put up an infographic saying the Iranians didn't actually declare a war on Israel. They just launched the largest drone and missile attack in history just to scare them a little because they knew it wouldn't make it through. And I was like, that is the stupidest thing to say. It's like the Japanese didn't really mean to start a war at Pearl Harbor. I mean, they thought most of the planes were going to get shot down. They thought they were just throwing a little surprise party. It's like, what world are people living in anymore? It's like... They tried to kill them. It's like, it doesn't matter whether they stopped it or not. It, like, going back on that, 
that's like 9-11 happening, but instead of 9-11, well, 9-11 being 9-11, the, all of the aircraft were hijacked and crashed somewhere, so then you go, oh my, like, Al-Qaeda wasn't really trying to kill Americans, they were just trying to scare everyone, it's like, no, they were really trying to kill Americans, that's what you do, you don't launch missiles intending not to kill anyone, they're meant to kill, they're weapons of war, uh, and so, and then another thing, it just blew me away. And then they posted an infographic talking about Israel's missile defense. They missed an entire system. Uh, which, uh, they, they missed a complete one. It was the Patriot. They just didn't even list it. And then the ranges for the other ones were freaking ludicrous. Like, they said that the Arrow 2, the anti-ballistic missile system that ended up getting that uh, exo-atmospheric interception that we saw... They said that that thing had a range of 2,400 kilometers. It's like, ain't no way in hell, sugar, because if it had a 2,400 kilometer range, they would have been shooting down the missiles at their launch sites and ran with that thing. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have even gotten close to Israel. That, like, I, like, I've seen some stupid stuff like that, and I'm like, how in the hell? Like, like I just got to say, that kind of stuff just gets me infuriated. It's like, how in the hell can you live in such a, like, a fictitious world? And then at the same time, I've seen them support Ukraine. So it's like, how in the world do you justify in your mind the Russians now being the good guys in the Middle East and being the bad guys in Ukraine? I mean, aren't the bad guys the bad guys and the good guys the good guys and they don't really change depending on the region? Um, like, that's how I look at it. Probably whatever, whatever they're being told, they just kind of follow it. They probably don't know why they're supporting Ukraine either. Probably not. I, I, feel, I feel like people like those do a massive disservice to whatever... Uh, whatever groups they're a part of is they don't even know why they're supporting them. They just support them so fervently and then have no damn clue. Uh, it, like it, it really, really, it actually just blows me away. It's, it's crazy to me. But anyways, um, with that, I hope that does address that fairly well, at least in my opinion. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Cat Chaser, who puts in a four dollar donation and says the U.S. needs to get a second carrier to the Middle East. And I think that we do. Uh, we have the USS Dwight, the Eisenhower, and the USS Baton in the area. I believe that we probably have another uh, Nimitz-class carrier we could send into the area, at least uh, a Nimitz-class uh, carrier fleet or a carrier group. Uh, and I think that we should send one that way, just to be ready, just, just in case. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that the best I can. And thank you so much once again for the support. And with that, we are on to the next one. And up next, we have another one from Cat Chaser who puts in a two and says uh, uh, oh. something something right there. I'm not sure how to say that. Uh, and all are not trying to be had with that. But uh, they said it says Russian airbase hit hypersonic missiles. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to find it, Matthew. I'm trying to find it just to double make sure. Um, oh, I think that's the name of another YouTuber, actually. <laughs> I don't know what, when I read that the first time, I was like, what in the hell does that say? <laughs> but never mind. And which, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. Uh, and yes, uh, we, we did report on that here on this channel. I got to thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the last one goes to Badger Bro, who puts in a two. And thank you very much, Badger Bro, hey! once again for that support. And we are now moving into our live chat questions. And up first, we had the Morse code decoders of the stream. Tonight... Cliff Simonson, Mark Hodges, Earl Bernou, Paul Schultz, Kevin J, Rumble Stilts, and David Millsaps, Toxic Bananas. They said, Enforcer, LSA Signal Corps reports, Russia is trying to play too many games at one time while losing all of them. And long live the LSA. And ding. That is the sound of money! And y'all hit that dent on the nail. That was the Morse code of the night. I gotta congratulate y'all for getting that correct on the 783rd day because that is truly impressive that y'all keep doing that with the same kind of determination that y'all had at the beginning of the war. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And Matthew, I understand that we have another Super Chat that just came in. And we do. This is the first Super Chat ever from Rex and Renikas, uh, who puts in a $10 donation. And thank you very much, Rex, and uh, for that support. And thank you very much for that. Enforcer, what say you? And I got to thank you so much, Rex, for the support. Your first Super Chat ever. I thank you so much for appreciating this channel and finding it worthwhile that you would support it and help it to keep running. There's folks like you. Help to make this thing possible. And so thank you so much once again. And while you didn't throw in a comment, the support does say a lot. And with that, we are now going to be moving on to the live chats. But due to time constraints, this is 1230 in the morning for us. Uh, and this stream has been going on for three hours and 30 minutes now. We are going to be answering three live chat questions and then rounding out tonight's stream. And so with that, we are on to the first one. This one goes to uh, W13RD guy who says, Why do we not help more than the Philippines? Uh help more in the Philippines or help more than the Philippines? 
why we not do more to help the Philippines? I don't know. Uh, it's a, it's weird. I don't really know uh, how to explain it because they actually have a big terrorism issue in the Philippines, uh, and they also have a big issue right now going on with the Chinese. Uh, and the reason why I believe that we don't give them a lot of help is once again, and I, I cannot say this enough, it's the constant freaking backsliding that we do in every region of the world. Uh, it, like the Philippines are our, are our allies. They are protecting their territorial waters. The Chinese are bullying their vessels inside of territorial waters. They are messing with the tenders. They're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And we're absolutely nowhere to be seen. I think it's crazy that we leave them high and dry like that. I don't know why we don't help them out more, but I think we should. Uh, there should be a, I would say this, going forward, there should be a policy of Chinese containment. There should be a policy of Russian containment. And I mean containment as in not allowing them to move a step forward. I'm not talking about the domino th theory that we had back in the Cold War, but I'm talking about pure on containment. Use any kind of strategies diplomatically, militarily that we can in the area around the world to stop the Russians' influence and the Chinese influence from expanding into other areas of the world. Same with Iran. We should be constantly trying to help allies in the region like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Yemen, and Israel to continue to fight, as well as the Syrian Democratic Forces, to continue continue to fight against these terrorist groups that exist within the region that are funded and operated by Iran and crush them where they are. If we continue to crush those groups in a very smart, effective, and precise way, the Iranians will be contained within their borders. They will not be able to do the things that they're doing right now. Same with the Russians. Same with the Chinese. We can contain them all, but it takes a strong spine and a strong will from the central, well, from the federal government in the United States to actually be able to forward this kind of idea or this kind of philosophy. We can keep the Western world safe. We can ensure that our sovereignty is secure and the freedom of our citizens is assured for, uh, for ages if we step forward and stand strong. And we're not doing that right now. I don't, I don't think we've been doing that for 10 years. And I think that we really need to start stepping back up and doing that again. And so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. Also, I'll say this, the reason why we don't step up and act strong is because we kind of started off this whole millennia um, or millennium a bad way with the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. That was standing up strong, but we found out later on in both instances that it wasn't really standing up strong for a good reason. Saddam Hussein didn't have weapons of mass destruction. And in Afghanistan, it ended up being a very long occupation to try and support a weak uh, government that we ended up creating that didn't last at all. It collapsed before we even left. Uh, and so that ended up leaving a bit of a sour taste in people's mouths in the country and in our leaders as well and keeping a strong foot in the world and making sure to represent ourselves well and contain our adversaries. I feel like that's really the reason why over the past decade our response to things has been incredibly weak is because people are scared to, uh, to look like they're repeating the same things that happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think that's maybe what it is, but we can't live in fear of the past. We just have to learn from it and keep moving forward. And that's the problem with the country these days. I feel like I feel like everyone, at least on the foreign policy end of things, is racked in fear of having another Iraq and Afghanistan happen. And we can't we can't do that. I mean, if we were scared of Vietnam forever, we wouldn't have ended up fighting the Gulf War, which was a very good war with good intentions. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the second to last question of the night. And this one goes to Urban X, who says, "Do you think Putin claimed to side with Iran only to entice them?" Uh, to first start a nuclear war? Uh, mm, I'm doubting it. Uh, I don't, no one wants a nuclear war. I'm, I'm very certain of that. Even Putin doesn't want a nuclear war. Even if it would not involve Russia, it would just be inside the Middle East. Uh, but I have a feeling that Putin is supporting the Iranians, so that way either they're, they are emboldened or he'll make the Israelis back off. The Russians do want to destabilize and destroy any Western-aligned countries in the region. It's not just Israel. It's Jordan and Saudi Arabia as well, along with the Syrian Democratic Forces in Syria and Kuwait and everyone else that's Western-aligned. They want to destroy these countries, but they have to go at them piecemeal, one at a time. And the best one to go for first is Israel, because it is the large, it is more so the most steadfast ally in the region, and it usually stays lock and step as best as it can with the United States, at least for its policies in the region. So they're probably wanting to go for them first and to stabilize them the most, so that way then they can try and pick off the other Middle Eastern countries or turn them towards the Russian side in the future. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that the best I can. And we are on to the final question of the night. And so who is the lucky last person to throw in the lucky last question of the night? 
And that viewer is Gordon Wallace, who says, Will y'all be able to remain broadcasting if we actually go to war? And I hope you can. Uh, yes, I think that we will remain broadcasting if we actually did go into a full-on conventional war. I'm fairly certain that we could. Uh, but let's see. Let me think. Uh, Matthew might actually, I, I don't know, uh, how selective service works because if we got into a major conflict and conscription had to begin. Matthew actually might be conscripted at some point. Uh, he does have a college degree though. So he would, he would be commissioned as an officer. So good on you, Matthew. Good job. Second Lieutenant. Well, you, you know, you'd actually get, you'd actually get called into maps and you'd have to go through a medical, uh, exam and everything. And they'd have to like verify that you were actually disqualified before you just like got exempted from everything. Oh, yeah. You'd still have to go. Oh yeah. But I, but I would still get disqualified because of the whole, you know, double major scoliosis spine looks like a pretzel you think if you think yeah yeah you know i think and then they'd be like guess what welcome welcome on board second lieutenant i'd be like really <laughs> i'd be like i'm gone i got drafted dude i would i would man, actually uh, andrew jackson was known as iron side you're gonna be known as uh something else man, I, spine. man they're gonna call me pretzel back <laughs> because i'm gonna be bringing in that <laughs> salt i'm gonna be bringing in that bread you know what i mean but beyond that um with that uh, now, now, Panning said Enforcer will be disqualified. You never know. I mean, you know, you could show up to MEPS, uh, and they'd be like, yep, you can go. And I'd be like, really? Uh, like, I would actually be, I would actually be kind of excited. Now, war is pretty, pretty tough. Uh, you know, like, as you see in Ukraine, we've been watching it for years. Uh, but... You know, still, like, that that's actually what I originally wanted to do with my life, is get into the Army as an officer. Hopefully, I could actually get conscripted into the artillery. Now, that would be a, a dream come true right there. It'd come full, full circle. But uh, beyond that, Matthew would probably go all the way in if he ever got conscripted. Uh, and I might get turned down or turned away. It would depend. Uh, so it really depends if a full war broke out and conscription began, whether we'd be conscripted or not. Uh, we would be able to keep the stream running if we were not. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that incredibly well. Uh, and also, Tom actually said, they have you doing communications. They probably have me in intelligence, which is a, it was just sad. Uh, because they'd be like, hey, look, this guy, like, he ran a YouTube channel, and he was pretty good at it, doing intelligence stuff. And they'd be like, put him in intelligence. I'd be like, damn it. I'd be like, this is not what I want to do. This isn't what I want to do at all. Uh, like, at that point, I'd be like, listen, I'm, I'm going to prison. I'm going to Fort Leavenworth. If y'all don't put me in the artillery. I got to be there. And they're going to be like, but you're bad Leavenworth. Man. Yeah, Fort Leavenworth, you know, like the... Oh, know, man, that's man, rough. Man, it's rough, but listen, if I don't get in the artillery, uh, it, it's it's all, it's go big or go home. If I can't get in the artillery, it's over. I don't want to be in intelligence. Uh, but <laughs> beyond that, um, I hope that does address that fairly well. Uh, but, can I drive the truck? Can, can I drive the truck? Oh, I, I won't be like hot oh, man. I can man. actually shift into second gear. Like, oh. I don't have a problem. I can go... That gear shift it's like, gives he, me yeah. nightmares. Oh, <laughs> man. Man, he 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 still he still like has those flashbacks to it. Like you know what, he's still flashing back to all those days that he couldn't shift in the second. He's sitting there grinding those gears down, just like his just like his brain. <laughs> oh damn! Like it's I was like, oh my lord. Um, but with that, I hope I answered that well. I hope Matthew added on to that really well because that was actually pretty funny. But with that. It is time to end. It is the end of tonight's stream. I'm going to thank all of y'all so much for sticking with us for two hours or well, three hours and 40 minutes. What a marathon stream. Uh, but we are more than happy to be able to run this thing because we got to talk to every single one of y'all. All 10,500 of y'all who were here at the peak, making up our peak audience, and the 133,000 people who have watched this stream so far. I thank y'all greatly for being here with us tonight and watching this news because while... It looked like a lot of y'all weren't going to be here at the beginning of the stream because of YouTube's massive glitch and, and outage that they were having. It did not matter to me whether there was going to be 150 of y'all here or 10.5 thousand of y'all here. I'm more than happy to run the stream and share the news with whoever we can. However many of y'all are here, uh, whoever many of y'all stay throughout the entire stream, we're always honored to run it. And I can't thank y'all enough for uh, giving us the honor of having y'all here with us tonight as we ran this stream and got to cover this historical news once again for all of y'all tonight. I've got to say so much once again. I appreciate all of y'all. And while I just combed over those numbers and they sound like statistics, I know that each and every one of y'all is as unique uh, as GunFox61 or Nova or Tezza or Alan Doherty or Snow White or Old Tubes or Tezza or Danny V. I know that all of y'all are each individual unique people and that's what makes it so incredible and it makes us so humble to know that so many of y'all come here each night to watch this uh if you're new to the channel and you really enjoyed it 
make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Subscribe, uh, most importantly, because that makes us so happy uh, here behind the scenes is when people subscribe. It does not help us out at all in the algorithms. Uh, a lot of people have a misunderstanding about this these days. YouTube actually restructured their algorithm just before this channel was formed way back in 2021 uh, in August uh, to where subscribers don't matter in the algorithms. It's actually just raw viewership and uh, click-through rate that actually matters nowadays. So subscribers do not matter at all. It just really makes us happy to see that more people are subscribing and really enjoy the channel. Uh, and so I hope y'all do. We've ended up getting um, 1.5 thousand subscribers today, um, which is unbelievable. We went from having, and let me get y'all the number here, 191,042 to now we are all the way up to uh, 192,498. Um, so a lot of brand new members to the Lee Spring Army, and welcome to each and every one of y'all. Uh, also, I got to give a huge shout out to uh, Rex and Dranakis, who threw in another five and said, I'd like to bring attention to the current escalating conflict in between Armenia and Azerbaijan. This conflict has the same major powers analyzed here. And that's true. We actually have covered that in the past. And when that conflict starts to kick off again, we'll actually circle back to it and start talking about it even more. But thank you for the support and pointing that out. Uh, but with that, Good night, good luck, take care, stay safe, Slav Ukraini, long live the Lee Spring Army, and the Lee Spring Army will never die. And good night, folks, and thank you all for another great stream, and we're getting so close to 200,000 subscribers, it's literally right around the corner. And also, like the Enforcer said, 134,000 people tuned in tonight to watch the stream, which is a massive number, and thank you all for liking and subscribing as well. And we'll see you all tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern for our next nightly war news stream. And with that, Slava Ukraine, here I'm Slava, and good night. Yes. The least free army sends its regards.